Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Got a cat. I've got a cat chewing on my knuckles here. He was being all cute, like he wanted to cuddle me, but now he's he's chewing on me. So this it was a trap all along. Um, how you doing, Nance? Chilling, man. Fucking, I'm ready to get into this badass book, dude. Um, this all this also kind of felt like. Oh, where have you been all my life? Man, I I'm really stoked about Koji Karatani. So folks, yeah. This is episode 9 in an ongoing series called Capital Mondays. Capital Mondays is not just a podcast, but it is also a thing that you can get involved with at tiers three and four at theory underground. The idea is, is that there's really in depth work that needs to be done. Uh, whether we're qualified to be doing ones doing it or not, that's up to you to figure out. Uh, but you know, I've spent a lot of time, uh, studying theory, studying philosophy, um, studying, uh, sociology, anthropology, political economy, uh, or or whatever it's like this is uh this whole kind of i don't i don't want to say this whole field as though all of those things totalize a field but really they all factor in on the subject matter which is the situation today and my concern is that this kind of content doesn't exist and we're trying to make a kind of content that can't exist um currently like and we're trying to uh, use the medium to do stuff that hasn't really been done, right? And so in in that effort, like putting so much time, energy into this, um, I still feel like I want to put more into it. Uh, we're, especially after that Sahil Intervenes episode, which was the last episode, I really want to, if we're going to bring on something like Mosley or Schwartz, if we're going to take it seriously, well, then I want to read it ahead of time. Um, I want to have some notes going in, um, a, a little bit more of a, of an idea of what I'm going into. Uh, you know, we've already found ourselves like in the, in the deep end of a debate that there was more to it than we actually realized. Right. And that, that's the thing is like, you got to start somewhere. Uh, and the idea is, is to kind of like lay out the learning process, flesh out the contradictions. And tarry with the text, take our time with it. And so we're still on break from Capital Volume One. We're still planning on going back through Chapter One. But before we go back to Chapter One, we'll want to finish off Mosley. We'll finish off Heinrich's book on Chapter One. We'll uh, still do Thomas Nail. Uh, and so, what are we doing over here with the structure of world history by Kojin Karatani? Well, we want to think about exchange. We want to think about exchange in the kind of nuance way that someone like Kertani is thinking about it. And he is um, value form, based in value form pills, as we would say. And so this, this guy right here is going to really show us why, or show it, yeah, show, hopefully show not just us, but also you all, why, um, when we're thinking about the value form, it's not just that it's that oh say it's all reducible to its uh exchange or that value only means anything in exchange. Um the the form of production itself, the form of labor in that mode of production itself, the relations of production themselves all have their character expressed through the value form as well and only makes sense through exchange. And you could centralize everything under uh, government control. That wouldn't change the actual uh, relations of production in any sort of substantial sense beyond um, some basic formal sense. But if the form remains the same, then it doesn't. it's just a name on paper. Tell me I own the means of production. It doesn't mean anything if I still have to work for them, right? If if the technological development um, is not headed in a direction to free me from 
slavery to them, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of very important stuff in this text that sets us up for being able to do that. Bringing it back around, I wanted to say, get involved with Capital Mondays. Seriously, we've got a really cool little gang of people on the free side. But whether this is going to be something that can really go on or not kind of depends on whether we are really going to be able to keep doing this uh, in the future. And whether we're able to really keep doing this in the future uh, is dependent on uh, whether we can stop funding it out of our own pockets. Um, and so, you know, because Nancy's going to have to go to back to work here pretty soon. Um, I am currently working, trying to make it so that I don't have to work. I wasn't even able to do this on Monday because I was dead. I was just like depressed and exhausted and just completely wiped out from the weekend's work. And uh, I was still kind of tuckered out on Tuesday, right? But these are jobs that I'm looking to quit in the next month here. We need a couple of people who see the value of this to get 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 in there. So even if you uh, can't be there for the live side, just get on with uh, tier three or four or go over to the Patreon and, and go for the big one. So uh, Nancy, anything you want to add to that before we dive in? Um, yeah, other than like, just get in the pit. Um, we're over here really experimenting and, and trying new things and, and trying to force the issue. What is the issue? Well, we're all retarded. Uh, the world's on fire. We're all going to die. Um, and again, we all die, right? But we're all going to die horribly. Um, if things don't change and or at least that's the issue as we see it. And we are trying to force the issue. But uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we are maybe we are stupid. Maybe we are wrong. Maybe we are barking up the wrong tree entirely. Um, and if that's the case, I don't know. Fuck you. Do it better than us. But if that's not the case, um, get in the pit. You know what I'm saying? Like, we open this bitch up. Um Let's get some more motherfuckers in here. And it take it, it it takes like material resources to be able to do what we're doing, blah, 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 all the things. Yeah. Um but the I guess just to emphasize, like, yeah, we, we are forcing the issue, we are pushing the envelope, we are trying to do something that uh just isn't done. Um and uh I mean, I'm sure there are people who who can just passively consume this and it is what it is and it's indistinguishable from their perspective. Um, but I'm also nah, confident, nah, not, not just confident, I also know that there are people who see the uniqueness or, yes. or the, I don't know, see the singular uh, character of, of what's going on here. Um, yeah, we've got a crew. Through having conversations with, with people. Um, so, yeah. I I I love what we're doing. Um, I hope I hope it it only continues to grow and and out, outlast us as an institution, or at least this new medium that we're experimenting with. Um, I care less about the form. I do care more about the content. Um, so yeah, if if you're down for the cause, you know what's up. If not, fuck you. You're gonna die soon. I don't know. <laughs> no, nah, seriously. So, uh, we on, on our free side though, special shout out to me, Panther and Sahil. They're the two that get the biggest shout out of the week because they both gave really elaborate or like thorough, uh, comments on the Sahil intervention video, uh, where me Panther shared three series of quotes in three notes. Um, those are canon now. And Sahil responded. And I think that both of those, uh, all the, the, that whole comment section is going to get its own standalone treatment when we're feeling up to returning to this, because yeah, I'm kind of over it. I'm I like, I'm at this point where I'm like, well, if I have to reread anything from Mosley or finish Mosley. Uh, I have to do it with new eyes. I have to take a break because right now I'm just kind of like, ah, uh, I'm sorry. There's several things in our orders of priority. Like 
we still want to do these other things, but now we have to do Karatani. This is all related though. And so I think y'all going to love it with that. Uh, Nance, how about you read the, uh, that four page preface? I'm going to go eat some food really quick while I'm listening downstairs. Um, and then we'll hit the introduction. It's like a 30 page introduction. Uh, it, it's going to give you a strong sense for what's going on in this text. Uh, even if you haven't done the other episodes of Capital Mondays, I expect that you'll get a lot out of this as a standalone video. And then it's yeah. likely some, someone might recommend you this video as a standalone video. You know, oh, you don't need to listen to these assholes on all of your episodes. They've got hundreds of episodes at this point. Who cares? This is going to be a standalone value because this text is not going anywhere anytime soon. And I would just say that this is basically like if someone who is based and value pilled did what David Graeber was trying to do in debt the first 5,000 years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, this is a good point of ingress for new people. And I, I do think this will be kind of like a touchstone. Um, structure world history is fucking based as fuck. Um, Sick. So let's right, we'll fucking get to, get it. to it. Yeah. Author's preface to the English translation. Let me big this up a little bit more. This book is an attempt to rethink the history of social formations from the perspective of modes of exchange. Until now, in Marxism, this has been taken up from the perspective of modes of production, from, that is, the perspective of who owns the means of production. Modes of production have been regarded as the economic base, while the political, religious, and cultural have been considered the ideological superstructure. In the way it splits the economic from the political, this view is grounded in capitalist society. Accordingly, the view runs into difficulties in trying to explain pre-capitalist societies. In Asiatic or feudal societies, to say nothing of the clan societies that preceded these, there is no split between political control and economic control. Moreover, even in the case of contemporary capitalist societies, Viewing the state and nation as simply ideological superstructures has led to difficulties because the state and nation function as active agents on their own. <clears throat> Marxists believed that ideological superstructures such as the state or nation would naturally wither away when the capitalist economy was abolished. But reality betrayed their expectation and they were tripped up in their attempts to deal with the state and nation. As a result, Marxists began to stress the relative autonomy of the ideological superstructure. In concrete terms, this meant supplementing the theory of economic determinism with knowledge derived from such fields as psychoanalysis, sociology, and political science. This, however, resulted in a tendency to underestimate the importance of the economic base. Many social scientists and historians rejected economic determinism and asserted the autonomy of other dimensions. Even as it led to increased disciplinary specialization, this stance became increasingly widespread and accepted as legitimate, but it resulted in the loss of any totalizing systematic perspective for comprehending the structures in which politics, religion, philosophy, and other dimensions are interrelated as well as the abandonment of any attempt to find a way to supersede existing conditions. And just as a little interjection here, I think that's a great kind of summary of the new left. I think that's a great way to handle, to, to both introduce um, and kind of deal with postmodernism um, as you know, as people see it. Okay. In this book, I turn a new... <clears throat> In this book, I turn a new to the dimension of the economic, but I define the economic not in terms of modes of production, but rather in terms of modes of exchange. There are four types of modes of exchange. Mode A, which consists of the reciprocity of the gift, 
Mode B, which consists of ruling and protection. Mode C, which consists of commodity exchange. And mode D, which transcends the other three. These four types coexist in all social formation. They differ only on which of the modes is dominant. For example, in capitalist society, mode of exchange C is dominant. In capital, Marx considered the capitalist economy not only in terms of modes of production, but also in terms of commodity exchange. He theorized how the ideological superstructure could be produced from mode of exchange C. Particularly in volume three of Capital, he took on the task of explicating how a capitalist economy is above all a system of credit and therefore always harbors the possibility of crisis. But <clears throat> Marx paid only scant attention to the problems of pre-capitalist societies. It would be foolish to criticize him on this, though. Our time and energy would be better spent in explaining how ideological superstructures are produced through modes of exchange A and B in the same way that Marx did for mode of exchange C. That is what I have attempted in this book. One other question I take up is how a society in which mode of exchange A is dominant emerged in the first place. Since Marcel Mauss, it has been generally accepted that mode of exchange A, the reciprocity of the gift, is the dominant principle governing archaic societies. But this principle did not exist in the banned societies of nomadic hunter-gatherers that had existed since the earliest times. In these societies, it was not possible to stockpile goods, and so they were pooled, distributed equally. This was a pure gift, one that did not require a reciprocal counter-gift. In addition, the power of the group to regulate individual members was weak, and marriage ties were not permanent. In sum, it was a society characterized by an equality that derived from the free mobility of its individual members. Clan society, grounded in the principle of reciprocity, arose only after nomadic bands took up fixed settlement. Fixed settlement made possible an increased population. It also gave rise to conflict with outsiders. Moreover, because it made the accumulation of wealth possible, it inevitably led to disparities in wealth and power. Clan society contained this danger by imposing the obligations of gift, counter-gift. Of course, this was not something that clan society intentionally planned. Mode of exchange A appeared in the form of a compulsion, as Freud's Return of the Repressed. This, however, led to a shortcoming for clan society. Its members were equal, but they were no longer free. That is, freely mobile. In other words, the constraints binding individuals to the collective were strengthened. Accordingly, the distinction between the stage of nomadic peoples and that of fixed settlement is crucial. As is well known, Marx hypothesized a primitive communism existing in ancient times and saw the emergence of a future communist society as that primitive communism's restoration after the advancement of capitalism. Today, this stance is widely rejected as a quasi-religious historical viewpoint. Moreover, if we rely on anthropological studies of currently existing primitive societies, we are forced to reject this idea of primitive communism. We cannot, however, dismiss the idea simply because it cannot be found empirically, nor should we. But Marxists have largely ducked this question. The problem here is, first of all, that Marx and Engels located their model of primitive communism in Lewis H. Morgan's version of a clan society. In my view, they should have looked not to clan society, but to the nomadic societies that preceded it. Why did Marx and Engels overlook the difference between nomadic and clan societies? This was closely related to their viewing the history of social formations in terms of mode of production. In other words, when seen from the perspective of their shared ownership of the means of production, there is no difference between nomadic and clan societies. When we view them in terms of modes of exchange, however, we see a decisive difference. The difference, for example, between the pure gift and the gift based on reciprocity. Second, when seen from the perspective of modes of exchange, we are able to understand why communism is not simply a matter of economic development nor of utopianism, but why it should be considered instead the return of primitive communism. Of course, what returns is not the communism of clan society, but that of nomadic society. 
I call this mode of exchange D. It marks the return of repressed mode of exchange A at the stages where modes of exchange B and C are dominant. It is important right, we, to note. Sorry. Though, uh, that, listening to this was confusing. Did, was there a little grid of A, B, and C? Or A, B, A through D, I No, guess? it's just uh, right up You already here. defined it, but could you... Could there are four... There, there, yeah, there's no graphic, but there are four types of modes of exchange. A, reciprocal gift. B, ruling and protection. C, commodity exchange. And D, which is the Alfgehaben of, or the whatever. Mode D is the, uh, the transcends other three, the return of the repressed, la, la, la. So the reciprocity... What what does he mean by pure gift versus reciprocity? Because I don't I don't see where pure gift fits into A, B, and C. Or did he just say that? So, pure gift would be pre pre exchange. So we're talking about or small maybe, hunt. We're talking about uh, something prior to exchange, where it's just like we're talking about a nomadic group that just splits everything. Like this would, like there is no exchange they out of just necessity. All... Yeah, they the the yeah the the condition of or the conditions of possibility for stockpiling don't exist, and so it's like we necessarily pool our resources and necessarily distribute them. There's there's no thought of ownership. Okay, yeah. No, that makes more sense. I was getting confused because I was like, wait. So yeah, yeah, he pure gift doesn't get its uh its own category of exchange because it is uh correct. It's it's kind of prior to it is to, not an exchange. Yeah. 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 It's a group so small that that's not necessary. All right. Hold on. Now I'm looking for the goddamn note. There it is. Because I think that's probably worth taking a note. Oh, I um, did. I, I've added it into the notes here. Okay. So if you look, um, actually here, let me refresh the table of contents. There we go. Now that the table of contents is refreshed, you'll see Kojin Karatani's The Structure of World History yep. is the top. Yeah. Hell yeah. And then uh, to that note, mode of exchange D is where that returns under the conditions of B and C being do dominant. So it's the return of A, the return of reciprocity um, while B and C, while law and order uh, and commodity exchange are dominant. So it's just a sublation of all A, B, C, D, or A, B, C. It's that. Yeah, I, I actually think it, I think it would be A, A being sublated through B and C. Um, Because it's like a return, right? Like we, we belong and there is reciprocity, you know, despite our material conditions where we do have to deal with law, law and order, and we do have to deal with commodity production, commodity exchange. Right, 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 right. And so that's part of part of what he does is he's not going to just be like, oh, the state is bad. So when we say ruling protection under B, he's going to get into it. But like this also means plunder, right? Like this is the plunder that eventually says, hey, you know how we come and we rape and pillage every once in a while? We'll do that uh less often and less severely uh and protect you from other people doing it in exchange for taxes or whatever so um this is well you know, and, this and yeah like taking that view that's laws laws universalize violence like law carries that threat of well if you weren't paying these taxes you know it's just like people now today which they're not entirely wrong, but when people say like, oh, if, if, you know, if it weren't for law and order, it would be, we'd be living in Mad Max. Like, yes, we would be, we would be living in some version of Mad Max. 
Um, it doesn't justify all the atrocities done under the regime of law and order. But also it's it like, is true that if yeah. you if you want to have a, a house with a white picket fence and raise your kids and shit, like that does necessitate some type of force. Yeah. And well, and the thing is, is you can go cr- try to create your own little, your own little Chaz. Right. Uh, grouping, you know, in yeah. Seattle or whatever. And, uh, well, it, it, that'll work out until you need ambulances. That'll work out until you need someone to stop the guy with the gun. And it's just like, I mean, there are still people who romanticize that period of anarchy during 2020 where there were these little spontaneous uh, emergent communities where people were trying to introduce reciprocity of the gift and all this stuff. But it's guys, we live in the world, you know? And so that's, that's one of the nice things about Karatani. He's got no, uh, he's not like, Ooh, the state's awesome. But also he's not like, oh, yeah, we're going to be able to go without it. And so like he's I think he's good for approaching the the pros and cons of it. But we'll we'll get into that in the introduction. For sure. Mode of exchange D is not simply the restoration of mode A. It is not that is the restoration of community. Mode of exchange D as the restoration of A in a higher dimension is in fact only possible with the negation of A. D is, in sum, the restoration of nomadic society. Yet this, too, does not appear as a result of human desire or intention, but rather emerges as a duty issued by God or heaven or as a regulative idea. In concrete terms, D arrives in the form of universal religion, which negates religions grounded in magic or reciprocity. But there is no need for mode of exchange D to take religious form. There are cases where mode of exchange D appeared without religious trappings. In, for example, Ionia from the 7th to the 6th centuries BCE, or Iceland from the 10th through the 12th centuries CE, or the eastern part of North America in the 18th century. We've been the Quakers and the Shakers and all those based Christian socialists. Which, I say based Christian socialist, obviously, that I'm not saying like, yeah, let's... Go get me a tribe life and all that shit. But uh, but I am saying like, uh, I mean, they had some good ideas, right? They also had some bad ideas. Anyway, what these share in common. (laughs) Oh, Jesus Christ. We have the the stupid shit we feel that we have. You had a conversation with Justin Murphy and now you're talking about base Christian socialists. (laughs) <laughs> now you guys are talking Look, about becoming man. no now you guys are talking about becoming nomad <laughs> yeah, yeah. no but i like how he just oh, said just, that though okay i like how he just said that that it is uh it's it's a negation of a through uh through yeah what, what we're calling zero right because he he doesn't give it its own yeah. little yeah. But yeah, so that's the nomad. So, and that's, this is counterintuitive for people. I think a lot of people are thinking when you think of like the, the society of reciprocity of the gift. Oh, Marcel Mouse, you're, you're thinking, oh, these are hunter gatherers. No, they're settled tribes. These are settled tribes. There's a big difference between a settled tribe and an actual nomadic hunter gatherer group. Um, and we are all becoming nomad. And so this is an interesting way of laying things out because there might be something to it because we are all becoming nomad. And so this could be kind of the bright side of that becoming nomad that at the same time is state realist. Whereas, you know, it's like D and G for instance, they don't really, they're too anarchist for that. It seems like so. Yeah. Yeah. The, they're too, uh, small brain anarchists. Um, Anyway, North America in the 18th century. What these share in common is that all were polis formed by colonialists, con- covenant communities established by persons who had become independent from their original states or communities. In them, if land became scarce, rather than perform wage labor on another person's land, 
people would move to another town. For this reason, disparities in landed property did not arise because people were nomadic, free, they were equal. In Ionia, this was called isonomia. This meant not simply formal political equality, but actual economic equality. Of course, these communities were all short-lived. They ended when they reached the limits of space available for colonization. These examples show that communism depends less on shared ownership of the means of production than on the return of nomadism. But in actuality, all around the world, socialist movements that aim to bring about mode of exchange D were generally carried out under the guise of universal religions. In the latter half of the 19th century, socialism became scientific and lost its religious hue. But the key question here is not whether socialism is religious. It is whether socialism intends mode of exchange D. Socialism in the 20th century was only able to realize societies dominated by modes of exchange B and C, and as a result, it lost its appeal. But so long as modes of exchange B and C remain dominant, the drive to transcend them will never disappear. In some form or another, mode of exchange D will emerge. Whether or not this takes religious form is unimportant. This drive is fundamentally rooted in that which has been repressed from nomadic society. It has persisted throughout world history and will not disappear in the future, even if we are unable to predict the form in which it will appear. Ojin Karatani, April 20th, 2012. Awesome. I'm going to get over on the whiteboard and set up the uh, A, B, C, D sort of grid that he lays out at some point while you're reading. But I'm going to start off by doing a little bit of the reading here. Let's give you a little break. Weird. I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. All right. Well, actually, I'm not going to be able to scroll. So, uh, let me uh right back. Yeah. Oh, it'll, okay. I can I can just go. Yeah, here we go. So, Mar uh chapter 1. No, sorry. Introduction. Marx's critique of Hegel. Today's advanced capitalist nations are characterized by a triplex system. The na the capital nation state trinity. In its structure, there is, first of all, a capitalist market economy. If left to its own devices, however, this will inevitably result in economic disparities and class conflict. To counter this, the nation, which is characterized by an intention toward communality and equality, seeks to resolve the various contradictions brought about by the capitalist economy. The state then fulfills this task through such measures as taxation and redistribution or regulations. Capital, nation, and state all differ from one another, with each being grounded in its own distinct set of principles, but here they are joined together in a mutually supplementary manner. They are linked in the manner of a Bohemian knot, in which the whole system will fail if one of, these, if one of the three is missing. No one has yet adequately comprehended this structure, but in a sense we can say that G. W. F. Hegel, in The Philosophy of Right, attempted to grasp it. But Hegel regarded capital nation-state as the ultimate social form and never considered the possibility of its being transcended. Having said that, if we wish to transcend capital nation-state, we must first be able to see it. Accordingly. We must begin with a thorough critique, investigation, of Hegel's philosophy of right. Quick question. Um, I mean, I've been meaning to brush up on the philosophy of right for a long time. I don't remember it. I really don't. It was it, it when I read it. It was in a quick way. It it didn't turn out to be fundamental for what I was writing at the time. Um, I don't remember him talking about capital. I don't remember him laying out capital nation state. Um, does he? Do you remember that? 
Well, when he's talking about history, no. So talks about talks about state and like, like history. His, yeah, it's like is is Keratani's uh supplementing third estate for capital and you know is nation and religion like synonymous for him or i don't know these are just questions we can keep reading but in his youth Karl marx launched his intellectual career with a critique of hegel's philosophy of right at the same time in contrast to hegel's system that posited the nation state in the final position marx maintained that state and nation were part of the ideological superstructure and that it was really bourgeois society the capitalist economy that formed the fundamental base structure. Moreover, he applied this view to the totality of world history. For example, Marx writes, The general conclusion at which I arrived and which once reached became the guiding principle of my studies can be summarized as follows. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations, which are independent of their will, namely relations of production appropriate to a given stage in the development of their material forces of production. The totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. The changes in the economic foundation lead sooner or later to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. In studying such transformations, it is always necessary to distinguish between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production which can be determined with the precision of natural science and the legal, political, religious, artistic, or philosophic, in short, ideological forms. Uh, lost my place. Ide ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. In broad outline, the Asiatic, ancient, feudal, and modern bourgeois modes of production may be designated as epochs marking progress in the economic development of society. The bourgeois relations of production are the last antagonistic form of the social process of production. Antagonistic not in the sense of individual antagonism, but of an antagonism that emanates from the individual's social conditions of existence. But the productive forces developing within bourgeois society create also the material conditions for a solution of this antagonism. The prehistory of human society accordingly closes with this social formation. What, where is that footnote from? Where is Marx saying this? Or do you remember where Marx says this? No. <clears throat> is it in the main, it could be in the manifesto, right? It's like, obviously, I've seen Mark say stuff like this, but like, where, where actually is it? Um, you go ahead and just actually, can you pull up the footnote? I'm going to make an actual note here in the notes, because this is a fantastic quote. Um, introduction. So my note for this is going to be basically, uh, Karatani needs to get into the triplex of uh, capital, nation, state, starting with Hegel. Um, yeah, what did you find? Oh, it's from the preface uh, to contribution. It, yeah, preface to contribution. Okay, sweet. Uh, amazing quote from the preface to the contribution to the 
critique of political economy, wherein Marx really lays out his fundamental assumption about the priority of base over superstructure. And see, the reason that I thought that that was probably in the manifesto was because that's where you get this more kind of simplistic uh, approach. And when I say simplistic, I mean that because whenever you start talking about how the superstructure actually determines the base, you get, oh, well, it's dialectical. And of course, we know that. And, uh, and, and so there's been like this big question for me of like, well, how much of Stalin's uh, dialectical and historical materialism is actually Marx and how much of it is actually just like an overly simplistic uh, state ideology. And it's like, well, this quote sh certainly seems to be enough for Stalin to be able to say, yeah, my simplistic stage theory uh, and priority of base over superstructure really has its um, uh, textual support. And so, you know, that's, we don't have to adjudicate on this too much, but I just want to say that the uh, the reason this matters is because a lot of what we do at Theory Underground, people will say, oh, that's just superstructure. Or Ben Burgess or Christine Louis de Soli will say, oh, well, that's culture. You know, that's culture. I'm talking about political economy. I'm talk but they're talking, you know, there's this distinction between serious and non-serious. Like, ah, political, political economy, this is serious. Oh, that, that's superstructure. That's not serious. And um, the legal framework, uh, philosophy, which is how we understand and interpret the world uh, and live the examined life, uh, as well as all of these other realms, uh, including art and everything else, being downstream from the uh, political economic is one thing, but it's like, guys, no, the actual state itself is put downstream from the political and economic, which is why you, th you know, this idea, oh, well, we could seize the state to change the, the base and then the state will necessarily change. But if this is a misunderstanding of how power functions, if this is a misunderstanding of how the state functions, well, then that, that's, that sets us up for some serious problems. That's why it matters. And when it comes to uh, the medium and how critical media theory shows us the fundamental changes of our reality that make it so that a lot of the assumptions that made sense in Marx's time don't make sense now. Um, this comes out of the developments of the, the 20th century, really. The, that would be called superstructural for some of these people. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and say that that necessarily applies to um, either of the two names that I just mentioned. My point is just that this is a constant uh, thing that we work under is this kind of like, oh, well, Marx wouldn't take this seriously and I don't have to take this seriously. Um, I don't have to read McLuhan. You know, this was like uh, Doug Lane was like, oh, McLuhan, a bourgeois thinker. Um, yeah, well, you know, but, but you know what? Baudrillard and uh, Virilio got from him was, well, oh, well, they could also be called bourgeois thinkers. And they're focusing on something that's not just political economy or history. And therefore, should we take them less seriously? Uh, my fundamental operating assumption for the last few years has been that this is not correct and that we actually have to uh, be dialectical about these inversions of the base versus superstructure priority. And that, yes, we can still be dialectical about it. We can still say, ah, yes, but it is dialectical. Ultimately, uh, there's still truth to this. Uh, the, the superstructure could never be what it is without the, the base being what it is already. But the idea that you can just kind of bracket out the superstructure and focus on the base, and that will be sufficient, um, yeah, the, the the operating assumption here is that that is not the case. And of course, we could always get more into that later. But for now, that's why this is serious. The last reason why this is serious is because of metamodernism. Metamodernism is uh, 
sexy new trend. And it's because there is a strong desire to go beyond postmodernism. And that is based in something legit. Uh, people go and they sit in on classes in literary criticism. They go to debate uh, events, you know, at, at high schools or colleges. They go to uh, sociology departments. And they get this taste of most postmodernism and they go, what the hell is that? That's, I don't like this. Like, I want to get, I want, I want to be a part of world change. I want to actually have uh, a role to play here. And it seems like postmodernism is just saying everything's a text and there is no outside and we can't ever know anything and everything's just interpretation all the way down. And I like the idea of changing the world. Well, uh, postmodern, uh, metamodernism is for people who feel that way about postmodernism, but who also, never took Marx seriously. Um, mm. Now, I have zero doubt that there are metamodernists who do take Marx seriously. Um, and of course, I haven't read uh, Hanzi's uh, newer book, the one that comes after The Listening Society, uh, but I don't get the impression that that's the direction it goes. I think that it's called the Nordic ideology. Um, and it's basically saying that the, the Nordic ideology of a sort of... Uh, social democratic welfare state is there's a genius to it and it's actually something special right but, but something that this that they, they don't seem to take seriously is like that these nordic countries um are where a lot of capital goes and that that's coming off of the backs of expropriated and exploited um global south conditions and so it's yeah, kind dude, of all like, the miners in Africa and fucking South America who like mine the materials that manufacture the the electronics and the weapons and all the shit that the wealth of those Nordic nations is built on. Right. Um, sure, they might get some things right, but also. I don't know, man, it's kind of gnarly. Yeah, it's a it's like a defense of social democracy that is primarily defending social democracy as a higher stage of human evolution from postmodernism instead of from Marxism. So instead of defending it from its best critics, it's defending it mm -hmm. from its worst critics. And the worst part about this is that you cannot understand what the postmodernists are doing, the so-called postmodernists. You can't understand their project at all without understanding what they're critiquing, which was worldview Marxism. And so you go, oh, I don't like this postmodern stuff. Yeah, but you don't understand why they felt the need to do it. The reason they need to do it now, of course, there is like this sort of, oh, well, it's a CIA psyop, you know, that there is that kind of argument. Um, even Daniel Tutt makes some uh, gesture in that direction recently on his Twitter. Uh, he was, except he was saying, we don't have to go to the CIA theory. We can simply say that, you know, and so I think he's more in dialogue with his homies over here at a uh, class unity, right? Um, Cause obviously like in these kinds of circles, there's always that person who's like, Oh, but actually, and actually Samuel Lankar uh, recently uh, sent me a source uh, that I'd actually read a few years ago on the same topic, uh, which was, you know, the, when the CIA started funding modern art, right. And it started funding, these uh Hold anti up. yep 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 and uh just just the whole movement of art for art's sake was an anti uh soviet uh like you know uh pushback uh funded by no, the look, CIA. man it's like okay i'm not no it wasn't however they opportunistically jumped on that train i will defend dada i will defend modern art because i i do think there's a lot of dope shit going on but I think no, it was this, opportunistically hijacked by the fucking State Department. And that's the thing is like there's something genuine going on with Lacan, Derrida, Foucault, Levinas, D&G, Baudrillard. There's something also there. And then when the when the CIA is going, OK, um, we don't like this this literal terrorist threat coming from these cadres 
They keep infiltrating the unions um, and, and they're doing it for Russia. We don't like that. Uh, what's going on over here with this post bonner stuff? Oh, it's not that? We don't care. Okay. That doesn't debunk the like what's going on there. And it definitely doesn't say that they understood what's going on there. I don't trust the FBI or the CIA's, uh, anybody working there's um, analysis of, of these thinkers. So we'll, we'll leave it. I, I was going to say we're going to leave it at that. But no, I actually have to finish this out. So to, to finish the thought on metamodernism, um, I like the impulse of being turned off to postmodernism. I like because I do see how a lot of people set up their little camp at base postmodernism. You know, it's like the base camp of postmodernism is like a place that a person never has to leave. They can kind of just hang out there and talk postcolonial theory, gender theory, queer theory, um, you know, critical race theory. They can just sit there and basically add fancy words to their their set of progressive assumptions, and you know, they're on the they're gonna. They're on the right side of history and they're fine, right? There's nothing more that ever really has to happen. Um, and so like the revolutionary impulse, the real push for genuine transformation, trying to actually get to the real, uh, that ultimately gets replaced by some kind of like, ooh, well, diversity, inclusion, and, you know, if we're super radical, reparations. And it's like, okay, guys, you know, cool, I get it. But also I see why the modern modernists are over it and want something beyond that. Um, and I, that they want to be able to say, no, signifiers can actually get at something. But anybody who's kind of coming from that camp is probably wondering at this point where this is going. But how does this actually tie into this quote? And the point is, is that this quote is stage theory. And stage theory is what metamodernism leads with and it constantly comes back to. They're defending stage theory. They think that we need to have a stage theory and that this is called problematic because it's called imperialist. It's called chauvinistic. It's the idea is, is like, oh, there's a higher stage of human existence. There were these lower stages, uh, some countries in current existence, they're lesser developed, meaning like they're less along this evolutionary, uh, progression and postmodernists want to complicate that and show why it's unjust or totalizing or, or whatever. And the meta modernists are like, Hey, we can, be good progressives and and recognize that there's complexities and problems and bring some nuance to it, but still defend a real stage theory because we need to have a stage theory so we can understand where we've been and the possibilities for where we're going. And what I'm saying is, is that because they don't take uh, people like Levinas and Derrida seriously as critics of Stalin's historical and dialectical materialism, much less uh, something like Scheler or Hitler's actual conception of history, which was also a stage theory, because they don't understand these postmodernists as critics of these Stalinist or Hitler kinds of uh, simplistic stage theories, uh, they, they completely miss the, the, what's at stake in the argument and, and why uh, this became the dominant scene in these uh, interpretive spaces, okay? And so that's why it matters. It matters because stage theory is trying to make a comeback through the matter modernists, and I'm all for it. I've got no problem with it. I think it's a great conversation. I just want them to step up to the game and like take it more seriously to understand the material, political, historical causes for what set postmodernism up. Because when they talk about it, they act like it's just an idea that got popular and that we can basically fix it by having a better idea. Yeah. Yeah, from from what I know of metamodernism, it uh it's just a bunch of people doing postmodernism and not realizing it and saying they're doing something different. Um granted and I've she... only God, I can't remember the book now. Uh yeah, I haven't read too much of it. So I don't want to like mischaracterize it and talk shit about it. But the one book I read was laughably fucking just horrible. Um, and it was pot calling kettle black without even understanding what was really going on. But 
Uh, it's definitely interesting. It's something we've talked about multiple times, and I've just never gotten around to taking it seriously. Um, yeah. But it is important because it is growing in popularity. Well, the same week that this video goes up on the channel will be the week that that conversation we already had with Cadell and Owen Cox goes up. And uh, Owen had brought up metamodernism in passing. And so I, uh, you know, I, we kind of referenced dunking on it, but then we were going to move on in the conversation. And I was like, no, let's, let's unpack it. Cause I don't want to just be out here doing drive-bys without like explaining. And so yep. look, there's a lot of people who, who are really excited about men and modernism. I, I see why they are. I think that there's cooler shit developing here. But it's not as uh, established as the meta modern thing is, and so you know, it's kind of like with all due respect, um, it's cool, but there's something cooler happening over here, and it's because we don't just try to erase the 150 years that led up to the postmodern thing by acting like it was just a progress a progression of ideas like there was modernism then postmodernism no it's not a bunch of ideas these these ideas like modernism or postmodernisms are are like really 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 loose like ways of trying to approximate something very complex and in that complexity we have contradictions like uh like i was saying between you know this more national socialist versus you know Stalinist kind of conception of history. And there's a reason why there's a seductive value to it. Um, and there's also a reason why it's dangerous. And but there's also something to it. There's also literally something to it. And I think Caratani is going to be best for uh for getting at what's of value there. But then uh he he adds some levels of sophistication here that go very far beyond this. And so I'm going to sit here and take a couple of notes um, and let you keep reading. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm basically going to write about uh, what we just said. Nice. Frederick Engels and later Marxists would subsequently call this view historical materialism. The problem here is that this view takes the state and nation to be part of the ideological superstructure on par with art or philosophy. This represents a criticism of Hegel, who regarded the state as an active agent, subject. Since this Marxist view regards the state as a mere ideological phenomenon that is determined by bourgeois society. This led in turn to the conclusion that if the economic structure were transformed the state and nation would automatically disappear. This neglect of the active agency of state and nation would lead to various missteps by Marxist movements. On the one hand, among Marxists, it brought about state socialism, Stalinism. On the other, it helped lead to the, lead to the victory of those who opposed Marxism in the name of national socialism, fascism. In other words, Far from dissolving the state or nation, movements to transcend capitalism ended up strengthening them to an unprecedented degree. <clears throat> this experience became an important lesson for Marxists. In response, they began to stress the relative autonomy of the superstructure. For example, some Marxists, including, for example, the Frankfurt School, began introducing elements from Max Weber's sociology or Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis. Of course, in doing so, they were not abandoning the concept of determination by the economic base. Yet in reality, they tended to shelve the question of the economic base without giving it serious consideration. Moreover, this tendency led to assertions of the autonomy of other domains, such as literature or philosophy as well as of the ultimate indeterminacy of textual interpretation. And it hence became one of the sources of postmodernism. I like the fact that he, again, he's introducing and dealing with the new left postmodernism and, and Maoism. Like he's, he, he is like introducing all these things and saying, this is why it matters. Like you just did. I like that a lot. Um, I, I do think it's, 
more of a rare thing for someone to actually take the time to say, this is why it matters. No, this is why I was working at Amazon listening to this and I just got so excited. Like I was like, oh shit, this is awesome. But this is before I kind of made the connection with how this fits into the Mosley um, Heinrich yep. situation, which I mean, really like this stage theory, dialectical his, his materialist thing, like that's separate in a sort of sense from how exchange is going to get um, flushed out and elaborated on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's him saying things like this that makes me go, ah, uh, he's, he's on the level, man. Yeah. He's big brain. Very big brain. Galaxy brain, even. <clears throat> Moreover, this tendency led to assertions of the autonomy of other domains, such as literature, philosophy, indeterminacy, textual interpretation. Hence, it became one of the sources for postmodernism. But such claims for the relative autonomy of the superstructure led to the belief that state and nation were simply representations that had been created historically, and that they could not, or, and that they could be dissolved through enlightenment. This view overlooks the fact that state and nation have their own roots in the base structure and therefore possess active agency. That's why I'm a pro-statist anarchist. That's why I can say that. Because it makes sense. Previously, historical materialism has faced critical questioning from those branches of scholarship that explore pre-capitalist forms of society. Marx's division of economic base from political superstructure is a view grounded in modern capitalist society. For this reason, it doesn't work well, work as well when applied to the case of pre-capitalist societies. To begin with, in primitive societies, tribal communities, there is no state, nor any distinction between economic and political structure. As Marcel Mauss pointed out, these societies are characterized by reciprocal exchanges. This cannot be explained in terms of a mode of production. The anthropologist Marcel Salins, who persisted in using the concept of mode of production, devised the concept of a domestic mode of production, one characterized by underproduction. But this underproduction can be better explained through reciprocal exchange, because surplus products are not allowed to accumulate and are instead given away to others. Production necessarily remains under production. In the case of the Asiatic mode of production, the state apparatus, the military bureaucracy, policing mechanisms, and so on, do not somehow stand above economic relations of production. Rather, political relations between emperors or kings and the layers of bureaucracy that support them and the ruled classes are in themselves already economic relations. No distinction exists between economic and political structures here. It is the same in classical antiquity. The unique political systems of Greece and Rome, distinct from those of the Asiatic states, cannot be adequately explained through the slave system mode of production. Slaves were simply indispensable in, dis in securing the freedom and equality of citizens. Accordingly, <clears throat> if we posit that economic base equals mode of production, we are unable to explain pre-capitalist societies. Worse, we remain unable to understand even capitalist economies. The capitalist economy is itself dependent on its ideological superstructure, to wit, its vast system based on money and credit. In order to explain this, in capital, Marx began his inquiry not from mode of production, but rather from the dimension of commodity exchange. The capitalist mode of production, in other words, the relation between capital and labor, is organized through the relations between money and commodity. Mode of exchange. But Marxists who advocated historical materialism failed to read capital with sufficient care and ended up trumpeting only the concept of mode of production time and time again. I just want to say we're not the only ones who fall into dunking on you know these worldview marxists who can't read right uh, i do feel bad when we fall into it I, I do think it's to be avoided i do think it's probably impossible to avoid however 
Well, I do. Wait, I don't. You know, I. <laughs> Keratani does it. So do we really have to apologize? Yeah. No, yeah. he. But he also like he's he's a little different than than us. I, we're a little bit quicker to call ourselves post Marxist, and he's like trying to reform Marxism, trying to call it to conscience and get it to take this more seriously. Uh, you know, I, I think he, he might be a little, he might be finessing it a little bit better than we were, but for sure. For sure. I think, I think, I think that we're just a little sophomoric sometimes, but also that's fun. We're having fun guys. Here, here. <laughs> the internet, dude, fuck you. It's the fuck. It's the internet. If you want to, yeah yeah anyway we'll keep going <laughs> <laughs> no and that's so, not yeah, to no. say like oh yeah we, this isn't serious but no it is to say like uh the same buffers aren't aren't in place we're not you know on the inside of academia we can uh we can look like buffoons and it's not going to hurt our career so we we are more freed up to buffoonery than others that's all that's not to say we're not taking it seriously um and i think that's evidenced by already what's been produced but just in case anybody's here for a one-off um we're not just here shitting around we are taking this seriously yeah um we're just maybe a little more goofy and silly we're we're quirky we're not like other girls here at theory underground we're, we're random um yeah. <laughs> so random <laughs> Honestly, like I'm like looking over at my soundboard. It's it's true. It's true. Um Get your hand off my penis! Why did you do this? Well, yeah. <laughs> what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese, a succulent meal. Chinese meal. Yeah. I forgot oh. you had me add that one. I forgot you had me add that like a couple weeks ago. So all right. Let's just uh, I want to go back to this paragraph we were just on. Um so accordingly, if we posit the economic base equals mode of production, we are unable to explain pre-capitalist societies, right? Because he's just saying that political and the state were inextricable from the uh, yes. mode of production. And that slave society is a perfect example of that. You could have never had the, the, the form that uh, politics in the state took without the enslaving of peoples and how how was the enslaving of people done it was done through politics and the state right like the the politics in the state was the base to the economic base in ancient athens this is beyond dispute yeah there's nothing there's there is no explaining that situation that would somehow put the political oh, oh no no it all started with them being settled with agriculture and then they started trading things and no, 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 sorry. Plunder in the state comes first. Um, yeah. 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 And he'll, he'll get into this. He'll unpack it. It's going to be great. But um, then he goes, the capitalist economy is itself dependent on its ideological superstructure to wit. Oh, so wait, no, wait, sorry. He's worse. We remain unable to understand even capitalist economies. The capitalist economy is itself dependent on the, its ideological superstructure to wit. It's vast system based on money and credit. In order to explain this, in capital, Marx began his inquiry not from mode of production, but rather from the dimension of commodity exchange. The capitalist mode of production, in other words, the relation between capital and labor, is organized through the relations between money and commodity mode of exchange. But Marxists who advocated historical materialism failed to read capital with a sufficient care and ended up trumpeting only the concept of mode of production time and time again yeah um so in the conversation we had with Sahil I think for me I think this was a sticking point the fact that like it it, it is kind of dependent on like this mode of production itself um arose out of exchange and universal universal interchangeability and exchangeability um and so he was like yeah for sure he then yeah, went he on to say it. but because it's 
because it's ubiquitous, it like the origin isn't the exchange. The origin remains in the exchange. However, the the functional source now lies in production because this mode of production is, for the most part, ubiquitous. So if I understand his point um, that he was making and that I, I believe to be representative of maybe the more big brain labor theory of value is that, yes, <clears throat> it is ultimately an exchange relation, but because that exchange relation is universal, we can place that source of value in the mode of production. So I like in my mind, like I would articulate that back to him by just saying, okay, so you're just bracketing out anything outside of this system of value. Like if you want to analyze, if you want to stay in this box, okay, sure. If you want to call that the ultimate source, that's fine. But you're you're staying in the box. You're not like you're not entertaining the idea of an outside of the box. Um and in, in this case, here with Karatani, the outside of that box is pre-capitalist societies, is the idea of something beyond a capitalist society, like anything outside. Like it it really, to me, always does come back to like if you're situating value and labor and labor alone, it it does come back to like, oh, so you just you just accept it then. I like dude, he's big. Um uh, He's 10 pounds now for people who don't have wow. eyes on screen, um, eyes off screen. Wow. Uh, I was just holding Ryan because he was attacking my hand while I was trying to focus on what you're saying. So I had to stand up and bounce him around to get his nervous energy out. But uh, I think that this, this uh, I want to hear what Sahil will say to you. Uh, my, my assumption is, is that, uh, well, I don't have it. No, I, I, when I re-listened to that conversation, I was like, wait, no, what is the, is it that, is it that he's just bracketing it out then? Or is it that he's just saying, no, like, yeah, is, is it, is it, yeah, is it a pragmatic bracketing? Um, Because it says, like, well, exchange is kind of just always going to be, I, I have no idea. I actually don't know. Mm -hmm. So like, that that's my, that's my issue is that I don't know if it's just pragmatic uh, bracketing or not like, uh, like, Oh, a, a point of emphasis that we'll choose because by changing the mode of production, we'll be able to actually change things. So we should focus on it because when, uh, Heinrich makes the focus of things exchange, uh, it's as though that's the sole source of value when it's not right. I get, I get saying that use value is a, is a necessary condition Exchange value is a necessary condition. Both are insufficient without one another. When combined, now you have the sufficient conditions for commodity exchange um, and that we might be able to uh, decommodify, change the mode of production, and therefore get out of it. And it's like, uh, but, but the doing so would require more of a focus on that what's going on at the point of production. I get that, but... Um, I, yeah, I, I get that, 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 that but then that, I also, that, Heinrich doesn't ever say that the sole source is, is no. exchange. It's just that it, it's just that, that use is a insufficient condition. And then moreover that, uh, there's no, the, 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 the idea of, of the commodity form, uh, having like this useful quality in how we think about it in the world that we live in has been determined by this mode of exchange. I don't know. Um, yeah. Like, and like we would necessarily have a new idea of exchange if we, if we wanted to change production, it, like it would, it would have to come after we changed our conception of exchange because things are produced solely for exchange and they're not even produced for for exchange anymore they're produced to open up the possibility of exchange and a lot of the time in order to open up the possibility of exchange you have to actually destroy what has been produced um 
it's a long conversation that's probably hopefully going to go on in, for a long time um because i don't think anybody has like a, a solid answer right now that we could just rattle off and solve all the questions all right so i'm gonna keep i'm gonna start reading try how about you do notes and scroll and you try to you know, at least do one sentence per page of like, what's the most important thing that he's doing on that, on that page. And kind of every couple pages, I'll ask you what your notes for those two pages were. And we'll kind of play that game where we keep taking tur turns back and forth, you know, like two pages at a time. So for these reasons, we should abandon the belief that mode of production equals economic base. This does not in any way mean, however, that we should abandon the concept of economic base in general. We simply need to launch our investigation from the mode of exchange rather than from the mode of production. If exchange is an economic concept, then all modes of exchange must be economic in nature. In short, if we take the term economic in a broad sense, then nothing prevents us from saying that the social formation is determined by its economic base. For example, the state and nation originate in their own distinct modes of exchange economic bases. It would be foolish to distinguish these from the economic base and regard them as ideological superstructure. The inability to dissolve state and nation through enlightenment is due to their being rooted in specific modes of exchange. They also, it is true, take on idealistic forms, but we can say the same thing about the capitalist economy with its base in commodity exchange. Far from being materialistic, the capitalist system is an idealistic world based on credit. It is, it is for precisely this reason that it always harbors the possibility of crisis. Which, as he said, is kind of like Capital Volume 3. I look forward to Capital Volume 3, man. I really do. Like uh, I'm starting to get more excited about it all the time. Because, yeah, I'm used to this Capital Volume 1 impression of things that is just like, ah, oh, yes, it's, uh, it's all about factories and, and people put their use values into things and then they trade things, but then they're not getting back what they put into it. And now that's happening with their labor power. And it's like, that's great. That's awesome. But also, uh, what about credit? What about uh, the global credit? The finance system, you know, like that's, well, uh, volume three really kind of sets the basis for that whole conversation, which we could build upon to then get to what we have today, you know. The types of mode of exchange. When we speak about exchange, we automatically think of commodity exchange. In so far as we live in a capitalist society in which commodity exchange is the dominant mode, this is only natural. But there are also other types of exchange, beginning with gift counter gift reciprocity. Moss located the principles for the, lo the social formation in archaic societies in the gift counter gift reciprocal system, under which various items are given and reciprocated, including food, property, women, land, service, labor, and rituals. This is not something limited to archaic societies. It exists in general in many kinds of communities. Strictly speaking, however, this mode of exchange A is not a principle that arises from within the interior of a community. Marx repeatedly stresses the commodity exchange, mode of exchange C, begins with exchanges between two commodities. The exchange of commodities begins where communities have their boundaries, at their points of contact with other communities, or with members of the latter. Even if it appears that these exchanges take place between individuals, in fact, those individuals are acting as representatives of families or tribes. Marx emphasized this point in order to criticize the views of Adam Smith, who believed that the origins of exchange lay in exchange, exchanges between individuals, a view that Marx thought was simply a projection of the contemporary market economy onto the past. But we must not forget that the other types of exchange also arose in exchange between communities. 
In other words, reciprocity is something that arose between communities. Yeah, so I guess like uh, mode zero, it's just like the pooling. So it's like we all go out, we hunt, we hunt, we gather, we all eat the same meals together, we all have the same teepees, whatever. We're nomadic. Versus, oh, now that we're settled, now that we stay in one spot, oh, we actually kind of have to start exchanging with the neighbors, right? That's where we start to get into Marcel Moss and Potlatch. In this sense, reciprocity has to be distinguished from the pooling that occurs within a household. For example, in a hunting and gathering band formed by several households, captured spoils are pooled and equally redistributed. This pooling or redistribution derives from a principle that exists only within the interior of a household or within a band formed by several households. In contrast, reciprocity arises when one household or band establishes lasting amicable relations with another household or band. In other words, it is through reciprocity that a higher order collective that transcends the individual household takes form. Accordingly, reciprocity is not so much a principle of community as it is a principle for forming larger stratified communities. Mode of exchange B also arises between communities. It begins when one community plunders another. Plunder, in itself, is not a kind of exchange. How, then, does plunder get transformed into a mode of exchange? I love this part. Because I never thought about this shit as a mode of exchange, guys. I never, ever thought about this as a mode of exchange. He says, if a community wants to engage in continuous plunder, the dominant community cannot simply carry out acts of plunder, but must also give something to its targets. It must protect the dominated community from other aggressors, as well as foster it through public works such as irrigation systems. Herein lies the prototype for the state. Weber argued that the essence of the state was its monopoly on violence. This does not simply mean that the state is founded on violence. The state protects its constituent peoples by prohibiting non-state actors from engaging in violence. In other words, the establishment of the state represents a kind of exchange in that the ruled are granted peace and order in return for their obedience. This is mode of exchange B. There is one other point I should note here. When the economic anthropologist Karl Polanyi, Pol Polanyi lists the crucial unifying forms of human economy in general, in addition to reciprocity and exchange, he includes redistribution. He regards redistribution as something that has always existed, from archaic societies to the contemporary welfare state. But the redistribution occurring in archaic societies was of a different nature from that occurring under a state. For example, in a chiefdom society, it appears as if each household is subjected to taxes by the chief. But this is always a form of pooling carried out according to a compulsory reciprocity. In other words, the chief does not hold absolute power. In a state, on the other hand, plunder precedes redistribution. It is precisely in order to be able to plunder continuously that redistribution is instituted. Like, just think about like, uh, ancient Egypt with its storehouses of grain. And then, of course, they could give everybody some grain on a holiday. Here you guys go. But, of course, where did that come from? Came from, like, the fact that they are, you know, the monopoly on plunder. It is precisely in order to be able to plunder continuously that redistribution is instituted. Redistribution by the state historically takes place in the form of public policies, irrigation systems, social welfare, or public order. As a result, the state takes on the appearance of an authority acting on behalf of the public. The state, monarchy, 
is not simply an extension of tribal society's chiefdom. It instead originates in mode of exchange B, that is, in plunder and redistribution. To find redistribution in an identical form in all societies as Polanyi does is to overlook the unique dimension that distinguishes the state. Think of like Robert Baratheon from Game of Thrones, right? He's, he just likes to have sex with prostitutes, drink wine, and go on the hunt. Why does he only like to do those three things? It's because he's now having to serve the function of king, but that was never really what he was. He was always a rowdy kind of guy who wanted to go to war. That's why he ended up winning in the overthrow of the previous king when that king was going crazy, right? So you had the, what was the name? Tigerian. Whatever the Tigerian's name was, the previous king was going, the mad king, right? Um, Robert Baratheon and, you know, forms a cohort with a bunch of the other, uh, uh, what are they called? They're not, are they princes? Are they, uh, you know, what is Ned Stark? He's, he's, he's called like a, he's like a ward. He's a ward. Thank you. Yeah. A bunch of the wards who rebelled, they're coming up on King's Landing. Um, by the time they get there, Jamie's already stabbed the king in the back because he was going crazy and saying like, literally kill everybody. Right. So power gets to a point where it ossifies. Corruption occurs, inbreeding, whatever. This is kind of just like how things often go historically. And there's a rebellion. Well, but who wins that rebellion? It's, it's probably someone who's good at plunder, who's good at war, right? But then that person has to do the thing that a king does, which is kind of make sure that everyone's taken care of. That's not a fun job if... You're the rowdy kind of Robert Baratheon guy who just wants to run around and rape and pillage. Um, it's, it's a job much better suited to a kind of like bureaucrat with a heart in the right place, right? And so this is like the old tug of war in those kinds of societies. Of course, I use Game of Thrones instead of real historical examples because that's obviously what everybody's a lot more familiar with. No, but it's also because I don't, have the historical chops to really talk on these things. But Polanyi and Weber are both uh, thinkers of capitalism that I've really wanted to dive into for like six, seven years. And so it's really exciting to see that he's bringing them in. They're usually seen as like incidental or not essential to uh, a Marxist project, um, Weber was some kind of a, he wasn't a Marxist, he's just, you know, but he's a sociologist. Polanyi, similarly. Um, Nancy Fraser, when I interviewed her a long, long time ago, was all about Polanyi, but, you know, she's kind of a social democrat, and so, you know, this is, look what he's doing, look, Caritani's talking about it right here. Polanyi's whole thing was basically just saying, yeah, well, this is, uh, this is, this is the state's role, is to do redistribution. And uh, yeah, but that's because it is already, always already plundering. Next, we have mode of exchange C, or commodity exchange, which is grounded in mutual consent. This arises when exchange is neither constrained by the obligations inherent in gift giving, as in mode of exchange A, nor imposed through violence, as in the pillaging of mode of exchange B. In some, commodity exchange is established only when the participants mutually recognize each other as free beings. Accordingly, when commodity exchange develops, it tends to free individuals from the primary communal constraints that arise from the principle of gift exchange. The city takes form through this sort of free association between individuals. Of course, as a secondary community, the city also functions as a kind of constraint on its members, but this is of a different nature from the primary community. All right, that's a couple of pages. What you got? Um, 
page five commodity exchange isn't it the only type of exchange the fish doesn't see the water um mouse sock gift counter gift as the root of social formation Marx saw that commodity exchange arises from in-group, out-group need to exchange between boundaries. Reciprocity arises between boundaries of in-groups. Mutual pooling happens within the in-group. Um, plunder also arises in the boundaries between in-groups. Plunder is the birth of law and order. Page six, old timing redistribution is pooling. Modern redistribution is downstream of plunder. Redistribution is instituted so that plunder can be infinitely repeatable. And commodity exchange presupposes mutual consent between participating in groups rather than coercion or force. I'll just say force. It's funny people be like, oh, but the, you know, the uh, private, you know, the, the ability to do commodity exchange is based in uh, private property and private property is this thing secured by the state. And it's like, yeah, also the state secured the division of labor and a mode yeah. of plunder and redistribution prior to that thing, which this really, and importantly, like private property is people using the state against the state to try to protect themselves from the plunder in the first place. That's where liberalism comes out of. That's what John Locke is thinking about when he is deconstructing um, the divine right of kings and then building in the, in his first treaties on government and then in his second treaties on government establishing um through a labor theory of value uh or it's it's actually more like a labor theory of property um you know this sort of natural right over the fruit of your labor but he's doing this all as a defense against being plundered in the first place yeah <clears throat> What is crucial in the case of commodity exchange is that its premise of mutual freedom does not mean mutual equality. When we speak of commodity exchange, it may appear that products or services are being directly exchanged, but in fact, this takes place as an exchange between money and commodity. In this case, money and commodity and their respective bearers occupy different positions. As Marx wrote, money possesses the power of universal exchangeability. A person who has money can acquire the products or employ the labor of another without resorting to violent coercion. <clears throat> For this reason, the person who has money and the person who has a commodity, in other words, the creditor and the debtor, are not in positions of equality. The person who possesses money attempts to accumulate more money by engaging in commodity exchange. This is the activity of capital in the form of the movement of self-valorization of money. The accumulation of capital takes place not through physical coercion of the other, but through exchanges grounded in mutual consent. This is possible through the difference, surplus value, that is realized through exchanges across different systems of value. This is not to say that such exchanges do not generate differences between rich and poor, of course they do. In this way, mode of exchange C, commodity exchange, brings about relations of class, which are of a different nature from the relations of status that are generated by mode of exchange B, even though these two are often connected. In addition to these, I must also describe mode of exchange D, this represents not only the rejection of the state that was generated through mode of exchange B, but also a transcending of the class divisions produced in mode of exchange C. We might think of mode of exchange D as representing the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension. It is a mode of exchange that is simultaneously free and mutual. Unlike the other three modes, mode of exchange D 
does not exist in actuality. It is the imaginary return of the moment of reciprocity that has been repressed under modes of exchange B and C. Accordingly, it originally, it originally appeared in the form of religious movements. <clears throat> There's one more point I should add here with regard to the distinctions between modes of exchange in trying to find in the political a relatively autonomous, unique domain. Carl Schmidt writes, let us assume that in the realm of morality, the final distinctions are between good and evil. In aesthetics, beautiful and ugly. In economics, profitable and unprofitable. In the same way, Schmidt argues, the final distinction unique to the political is that between friend and enemy. But in my view, this is a characteristic of mode of exchange B. Accordingly, the unique domain of the political must originate in the economic base broadly defined. <clears throat> it is just as true that there is no unique domain of the moral separate from the mode of exchange. Usually, the domain of morality is thought of as being separate from the economic realm, but morality is in fact not unrelated to modes of exchange. For example, Friedrich Nietzsche argues that the consciousness of guilt originates in a sense of debt. This suggests how deeply the moral or religious is connected to modes of exchange. Accordingly, if we see economic base in terms not of modes of production, but of modes of exchange, we can understand morality in terms of economic base. Let us take the example of mode of exchange A, reciprocity. In a tribal society, this is the dominant mode of exchange. Here, no one is permitted to monopolize wealth or power. Once a state society, in other words, a class society, emerges, mode of exchange A is subordinated and mode of exchange B becomes dominant. Mode of exchange C develops under it, but remains in a subordinate role. It is with capitalist society that mode of exchange C becomes dominant. In this process, mode of exchange A is repressed but never eliminated. It is finally restored as the return of the repressed, to borrow Freud's expression. This is mode of exchange D. Mode of exchange D represents the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension. <clears throat> mode of exchange D was first discovered at the stage of the ancient empires as something that would transcend the domination of modes of exchange B and C. Mode of exchange D was also something that would transcend the religious constraints of the traditional community that was the foundation of the ancient empires. For this reason, mode of exchange D was not a simple return to mode of exchange A, but rather a negation of it that restored it in a higher dimension. The most direct instances of mode of exchange D are found in the communistic groups that existed in the earliest stages of universal religions, such as Christianity and Buddhism. In subsequent periods, too, socialist movements have taken a religious form. Since the latter half of the 19th century, Socialism has lost its religious hue. But the crucial point here is that socialism at its root marks the return in a higher dimension of mode of exchange A. For example, Hanno Rent points out that in cases of council communism, the councils, Soviets or Rate, appear not as a result of revolutionary tradition or theory. <clears throat> what is more, they never came into being as a result of a conscious revolutionary tradition or theory but entirely spontaneously, each time, as though there had never been anything of the sort before. This suggests that the spontaneously arising council communism represents the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension. And here we have a small graphic, small table. I'm going to... Modes of exchange matrix. I'm going to turn on uh, the mm. whiteboard here for a minute. Second camera. And yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm going to have you tell me what to put on the whiteboard and kind of imagine an audience of people who obviously don't have eyeballs on the screen. So you're and you'll be talking to me who won't have eyeballs on the screen. So you'll tell me what to put on the whiteboard and that'll help people imagine what's going on here. Um, Word. I dude, listening every time I'm back at Amazon has me so much more sympathetic to the people like whose eyes are off screen. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> just like, oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go. So there's actually two tables here. So one table. Um upper left quadrant would be mode B, plunder and redistribution. Um and in parentheses, domination and protection. But yeah, you don't have to put the parentheses there. We can articulate that. Upper right quadrant would be reciprocity, A. Lower left is C, commodity exchange. And bottom right is mode D, which is currently marked as X for unknown or to be determined or inarticulable or impossible or whatever, <laughs> because it is this state of sublation of mode A. And that is the modes of exchange matrix. Table two. Hold on, where'd you, yeah. Finishing touches. Table two, again, four quadrants. And it is B, upper left, state capital, or B, upper left, state. Upper right, A, nation. Lower left, C, Capital. And again, lower right, D with a big X. Again, for this mysterious thing that we do not have yet. And that is the modern social formation matrix. So it appears at, uh, at first glance these can be transposed one over the other. The modern social formation fits right over the modes of exchange. Uh, Wait, it's called the modern so table what? One, modern social formation matrix. And the first one is the modes of exchange matrix. So our hawk-eyed listeners might be aware of the fact that they go from upper left in a clockwise fashion, B, A, D, C, in both of them. So in the modes of exchange, it's B, plunder and redistribution. In the social formation, it's B, state. Exchange, A is reciprocity, and formation, A is nation. Exchange, C is commodity exchange, and social formation, C is capital, and in both, D is marked X, because it is this thing that does not actually exist. Um, it is an ongoing process, which is... I mean, why the fact that Kiritani is, is talking about it as a sublation is, is beautiful because it is this, this not thing that is kind of leading um, the end of the, the end of the that itself is not ever going to end. It's something that keeps trying to bust out through religion. Right. Like yeah. there's obviously you could just say state, nation, capital, religion. But I think that that the reason he doesn't want to do that should be obvious um, in that it's not just religious movements that have attempted something socialistic or communistic. People attempt these things all the time. Cults attempt these things and not all cults 
are religious cults. Also, giant nation state building projects that have explicit socialistic or communistic kinds of messaging, whether those be nationalist or universalist, it doesn't matter in this one sense. And that is that they're kind of saying like, there's a way that we can bring back the reciprocity of the gift. There's a way that we can bring back this thing that people do experience in modern societies because he's saying it never goes away. It's always there. There's always mutual aid. There's always fraternity. There's always this spirit of love and trust. And that's the Gemeinschaft, right? Like that's always there. So then the question is, is like, well, how do you achieve that? Um, some people would say Islam. Some people would say Christianity, right? Remember when we had Justin Murphy on his, he goes, well, Catholicism is the most tried and true uh, that it, it, it expands its umbrella, the, the widest for the most people. Uh, and so that's the safest bet when you're, if you're going to, if you're going to pick something, go with that. Um, I'm guessing he's probably got family involved. If he had grown up Muslim, he might've said, well, it's Islam, but obviously, uh, communism was secular in, uh, it's most popular and, uh, successful variants. And when I say successful, I mean, in, ter in terms of like popularity and influence. And so, yeah, is motive. So what, you know, there's this one way of reading Caritani where it's like, well, he's inverted based in superstructure. Now he's saying that religion's going to be the solution. That's a superficial, annoying kind of reading of Caritani. It is, we're not going to tolerate it here. That is not what he's saying. Anybody who tries to make him into saying that, uh, stop it. Don't do that. Uh, but, but at the same time, there is something trying to emerge in all of these various forms um, or experiments. And he's, by putting an X there instead of some, you know, some term that's been uh, soiled <laughs> by the, you know, historical developments, I think he really, uh, he sets his project up in a properly scientific way, right? It's like X has never existed. What could what could it be? I love that. Oh, and really quick, let's go back to the so you said I don't have to put the the uh the parentheses right, here. Right. So so the the parentheses are only in table table 1, the modes of exchange and it's just uh plunder and redistribution. Also, domination and protection. Also, I've been saying law and order. Uh, just trying to f fill out the the ideas of what's really going on. Plunder. I I like just using plunder. Um, but plunder also entails domination, protection, law, order. Um, these things. <clears throat> A reciprocity gift counter gift. I think that's pretty intuitive. Um, but it does distinguish from other interpretations of a gift economy where it does. people have people have thought, oh, pooling is also gifting. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, if without Keratani, I would have lumped pooling and gift counter gift. I think I would have. I just. Well, and I think, I think, I think Graber yeah. does. Um. I, I think that is the tendency. And I, I do think the distinction matters. I and I actually to, think Baudrillard, yeah. Baudrillard kind of touches on it a little bit. But yeah, I think Caritani really coming out and just saying it. No, there is a difference. Um, And then down commodity exchange, in parentheses, money and commodities. Um, Again, pretty intuitive. But uh, maybe just just to elaborate, commodities necessitate money. Money is itself the prime commodity. So when you're talking about commodity exchange, you're not just talking about physical objects. Um, you are talking about the monetary system itself, because money is just the the alpha dog, the sigma 
the Sigma commodity. It, it goes all goes wherever it wants. It does as it pleases. It is the ultimate Sigma male. That's hilarious. Well, okay, so that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, listening to this, I most bring Mike. Oh yeah, I don't have this automatic there we set go. up yet. Yeah, there we go. But yeah, listening to this was was hard tracking the A B C D mm. A B C D whole thing, you know. So it it was it was a lot harder to track. And so hopefully by fleshing it out like this, we've made it so that anyone who is just listening is able to get more from it. We've belabored the point for your sake. Word. Mode of exchange what, what, D. What, oh. what what page are we on here? So uh, nine. Nine. Okay. Mode of exchange D and the social formation that originates in it can be called by many names. For example, socialism, communism, anarchism, council communism, associationism. But because historically a variety of meanings have been attached to these concepts we are likely to invite misunderstanding and confusion, no matter which one we use. For this reason, here I will simply call it X. The name doesn't matter. What is important here is to understand the phase to which it belongs. To sum up, modes of exchange can be broadly divided into four types. Reciprocity, plunder and redistribution, commodity exchange, and X. These are shown in the matrix given in Table 1 where the horizontal row indicates the degree of equality or inequality, and the vertical columns indicate, indicate degree of coercion or freedom. Table 2 situates the forms that historically have derived from these, capital, nation, state, and X. The next important point to make is that actual social formations consist of complex combinations of these modes of exchange. To jump to my conclusion, historical social formations have included all of these modes. The formations differ simply in terms of which mode takes the leading role. <clears throat> in tribal societies, reciprocal mode of exchange A is dominant. This does not mean the modes B or C are non-existent. They exist, for example, in wars or in trading. But because the moments for B and C are here subordinated to the principle of reciprocity, the kind of society in which B is dominant, a state society, does not develop. Develop. On the other hand, in a society in which mode B is dominant, mode A continues to exist. For example, in farming communities, we also find the development of mode C, for example, in cities. In pre-capitalist social formations, however, these elements are administered or co-opted from above by the state. This is what we mean when we say that mode of exchange B is dominant. When mode of exchange C is dominant, we have a capitalist society. In Marx's thought, a capitalist social formation is a society defined by the capitalist mode of production. But what is it that distinguishes capitalist production? We will not find it in such forms as the division and combination of labor or again in the employment of machinery. After what all, was what was the one for B for uh, plunder and redistribution. Uh, he was saying something about cities would be in there, but um, he he doesn't say here. But he's talking about the feudal development. Okay. Well, yeah, you just put. We could just kind of generally put feudal there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had somebody like in the comment section uh, last year be like kind of give me grief for conflating a monarchical order and a feudalistic order. And well, I think that they would also have to give Keratani grief then because like Keratani is kind of just saying like, look, you have a king, he's got a bunch of feudal lords. 
right? It's Game of Thrones world. This is just the situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's easy to, well, um, actually, and there, there's obviously some value in that. But here, <clears throat> we're not like getting into those weeds. Um, and I mean, even Caratani kind of kind of goes on a little bit and hystericizes a little bit about like the idea of feudalism and how like the the European fucking tribes evolved into that and blah blah blah. Like, and he is he's always saying like, look, I'm not using like concrete definitions that are like these are not prescriptions. Again, they're they're functional descriptions. They're functional definitions. Um, we're not but we're like we're not super duper worried about form we are worried about content about what's being said so if these words don't work for you i don't know take the time have have notes while you're reading it and and take some notes and this and that but for us idiots from the internet um the real juice is this exchange um it's not in whether it's a feudalism or a monarchism or uh I don't know. I don't know all the other. I'm an idiot. I don't know. I didn't like we don't we didn't go to college and study prehistoric anthropology or whatever. I don't know, man. Like I get yeah. it though. I, I definitely get the enjoyment that people um actually so whatever. <laughs> I yeah. Words always fail no matter what, anyway, so fuck off. Um, but yeah, so he doesn't say it right here, but, but he does later on, um, <clears throat> talk about feudalism. So, and, and he's just using these terms as, as a contrast to highlight, um, as examples to give the reader a, a better idea of what he's talking about. If his, um, long descriptions and explanations are still a little vague, he's just pointing to these things and saying, look, this is an illustrative example. It's not a, a perfect platonic form of what I'm talking about. Rather, it's it's a picture that I'm using to try and enlighten the words that are coming out of my fingertips as he was writing this. Um, so in a tribal society, they would have these gifts, gifts in a feudal-ish society. Um, it would be plunder. And in a capitalistic society, it is the commodity form. And and when mode of C, which what the fuck? When mode of exchange C is dominant, we have a capitalist society. In Marxist thought, a capitalist social formation is a society defined by the capitalist mode of production. But what is it that distinguishes capitalist production? We will not find it in such forms as the division and combination of labor or again in the employment of machinery. After all, these can be found in slavery systems as well. Nor can we simply equate capitalist production with the production of commodities in general. Both slavery and serfdom systems developed as forms of commodity production. Capitalist production is different from slavery or serfdom production and that it is commodity production that relies on the labor power commodity. In a slavery system, human beings become commodities. Accordingly, only in a society where it is not human beings themselves, but rather human labor power that is commodified, can we say there is capitalist production. Moreover, it exists only when commodity exchange permeates the entire society, including the commodification of land. <clears throat> for these reasons, capitalist production can only be understood if we look at it in terms of mode of exchange, not in terms of mode of production. I'm actually going to take a little notey note right there. Yeah, I was just uh, <laughs> running back here because I was like, that that needs to go in. Yeah, you do it. I'm going to reread. It's that middle paragraph. I'll reread it as you go. So when mode of exchange C is dominant, we have a capitalist society. In Marx's thought, a capitalist social formation is a society defined by the capitalist mode of production. 
But what is it that distinguishes capitalist production? We will not find it in such forms as the division and combination of labor, or again, in the employment of machinery. After all, these can all be found in slavery systems as well. Nor can we simply equate capitalist production with the production of commodities in general. Both slavery and serfdom systems developed as forms of commodity production. Capitalist production is different from slavery or serfdom production in that it is commodity production that relies on the labor power commodity. In a slavery system, human beings become commodities. Accordingly, only in a society where it is not human beings themselves, but rather human labor power that is commodified, can we say there is capitalist production. Moreover, it exists only when commodity exchange permeates the entire society, including the commodification of land. For these reasons, capitalist production can only be understood if we look at it in terms of modes of, of mode of exchange, not in terms of mode of production. I, I so what what's your note here? Capital societies are determined by commodity production that relies on human labor power as commodity rather than humans as commodities when everything is commodity, including land. And then you added even data today. Let's use brackets instead of parentheses when we uh I'll 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 change it. I got that. Which is personal notes. I like to keep this bracketed. Um, Word. This, and then I, this is an emphasis on exchange, not production. <clears throat> yeah. And I think this is something. Because an emphasis. Than... An emphasis on production does reduce us. Us to nothing but our labor power. Whereas maintaining the distinction allows you to see what is actually happening, where the time, and in a sense, we have been turned into commodities with the datification of everything and blah, 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 blah. But again, maintaining this distinction, <clears throat> whatever, allows you to see what, what's going on. If you only care about production, then you only matter as much as you are productive. Whereas if you have a distinction and, and you can see, oh, so outside of exchange, I am something more. <clears throat> but within this box, I'm nothing but. Which is really fucking good. So I, I, I've said plenty of times that, you know, we can look at the history of humanity and its uh, social formations as uh, modes of uh, what I said, regimes of labor power, you know, like how the labor power is being, um, or, or uh, see, this is, this is when I say labor power becomes a commodity, I think that the slave is still seen for their labor power, right? Or is that wrong? And they're only seen for the labor that they put out. No, I think the distinction is that that slaves are just labor. Slaves are just machines. As bourgeois subjects, we can imagine um, that we're selling our labor power, which implies that that we have other powers, leisure power, creative power, love mm -hmm. power, whatever. But as a slave, um, you're nothing but a machine that produces labor. Like, I, th there is a distinction there. Um, yeah, in la it, one is that we turn ourselves into this thing that we separate from ourselves as labor power, and we do, and we we literally mold ourselves into labor power and hand it over. As opposed to someone that's just like, we're going to fucking force out of you this they're, labor thing. They're doing yeah. it to us. Like the same the same or similar operation is happening. Um, but 
taking a, a position on our side or whatever. It's it's a realist position where it's like I have to do this in order to meet the you know necessity. Um, whereas on the other side, it's just that's not even a possibility. That's not on your horizon. That's something that just doesn't exist. Like the question never enters your mind. Um, which is why, I, like I. <clears throat> Like it comes up all the time. Dignity of work, dignity of work, dignity of work. Like, yeah, it feels good to be productive. It feels it feels good to not just belong to something bigger than yourself, but to actually be productive, to work, to do, to to use force, to act in the world, to face that resistance. That feels good, but uh, that's also like a a shortcut right, right into workerism where it's like, well, the only thing that matters to me from this communal perspective is my ability to produce work, to act on the world, to, to face this resistance and to produce something. Um, you are totalized by a regime that only cares about your productive potential. Is the middle paragraph there? Yeah, right here. In a capitalist society, commodity exchange is the dominant mode of exchange. This does not mean, however, that the other modes of exchange and their derivatives completely vanish. Those other elements continue to exist, but in altered form. The state becomes a modern state, and the community becomes a nation. In other words, as commodity exchange becomes the dominant mode, pre-capitalist social formations are transformed into the nation the capital nation state complex. Only in this way can we materialistically rethink the trinity system that Hegel grasped in the philosophy of right, as well as how it might be sublated. And I like this because I mean uh, it's a it's a thing that we always say and by we not just us but like i just people anybody who's been influenced by marx will talk about how other social systems get sublated so the aristocracy still kind of exists and the you know the there's still there's still feudal elements in society and we could also talk about how commodity exchange uh and surplus value uh, in in its uh commodity exchange you know form like that did technically exist it just wasn't the, the main driver of society in previous social formations um i really do like this way of saying no all four of these or sorry all three of these have been present in all you could you you could also add zero the pooling right mode zero the pooling that's yeah, still also that, available in all societies, you know. Yeah. You got and various that's, homes. Again, that's that's prior to exchange. That what he's what what he's saying at um whereas Mouse says the root of social formation is in reciprocity, Bertani's saying, no, the root of so social formation is before that, because the social formation is a reflection of, you know, your subunit family. Or the small in group or whatever so that would be the the root of social formation would be like true mutual belonging and blah 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 which isn't exchange that's just that's toil that's toil upon the land so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. marxists regarded state and nation as parts of the ideological superstructure but the autonomy of state and nation an, auto an autonomy that cannot be explained in terms of the capitalist economic base does not arise because of the so-called relative autonomy of the ideological superstructure. The autonomy of state and nation arises instead because each is rooted in its own 
distinct economic base, its own distinct mode of exchange. The world that Marx himself tried to explicate was that formed by the mode of commodity exchange. I fuck it. I love this book, dude. I love that it's, right there. Like just that that fucking sentence. Or yeah. these these two sentences together. He's like, look. This is going on. This is prior to what Marx is doing. This is what Marx is doing. I like that right there. It's just short. It's sweet. It's punchy. I fucking love it. I love yeah, it. He he says in the preface that we skipped, the longer preface, um, that he hates these kinds of uh, classification systems. Like, he doesn't like classification systems. Like, he's spent his whole life deconstructing them. He doesn't want to have to do this. Right. Like he's kind of just like, this is not what I want to have to do. But he's also just like, it has to be done, though. He's like, uh, he, I think because he does this value form thing, he's tired of people acting like uh, a change in the mode of exchange would not change the, the base. He's tired of this base versus superstructure distinction being played out the way that it is. He's tired of acting like this is such a strong deviation from Marx that it becomes counter-revolutionary. He's like, it's not counter-revolutionary. No There's nothing about this that necessarily leads you to such conclusions. Um, it just might give you a better basis uh, upon which no. to change things. And it's like, the point is, is that it's not, oh, there's no such thing as a mode of production. It's just exchange. Dude. When we say mode of production, we mean mode of exchange. That's the point. Like the two things cannot be separated. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then finally, just like the, the it's a real big mistake to just take the uh, state and put it in the superstructure. He's like, look, I like the idea of the base. Just don't put the state there uh, in the superstructure. It belongs in the base with exchange. Yep. Exchange is also in the base. What's the problem? Um, where am I? Uh, this is the world we find in his capital. Uh, I'll reread the part you liked so much. Let, let's, yeah, and you can quote it maybe in the, in the actual notes. The autonomy of state and nation arises instead because each is rooted in its own distinct economic base, its own distinct mode of exchange. The world that Marx himself tried to explicate was that formed by the mode of commodity exchange. This is the world we find in his capital. But this bracketed off the worlds formed by the other modes of exchange, namely the state and nation. Here I want to try to think about the different worlds formed by the different modes of exchange, to examine the historical vicissitudes of the social formations that arose as complex combinations of these, and finally to ascertain the possibilities that exist for sublating those formations. Ooh, you know, vicissitudes and uh, what's the other word? We've got vicissitudes and we've got ascertain and we've got sublate. These are all college words, you know, but basically, I mean, there's a lot of that throughout all of these Capital Mondays things, but vicissitudes is just to say there's different ways that something can be. Those are called vicissitudes. It's a great word once you get over it. Um, and then the uh, ascertain is just like discerning, figuring out, getting to the bottom of. Um, and sublating is that negating, overcoming, but still including, right? And so I do appreciate how dialectical he is in his approach to all of this. That's that sublating yeah. idea. He's, it's a, it is a truly historical dialectical materialist uh, approach to history. It's just... Uh, it's it's a it's a kind of stage theory going back to this meta modernism thing. It's a kind of stage theory um, that's not idealist, but at the same time is not the kind of simplistic historical dialectical materialism that you have with a Joseph Stalin. Yeah, it's it's way more it's a, it's way more dialectical than people who love that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Now we're types getting of, on to our, our t- formation. Yeah. 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 Do you want to take some notes here or do you want to read it? Um, I'll go for a bit. Go. Page 10. Types of power. I think page 10. Page 11. Oh, shit. Um, types of power. <clears throat> I would like to next consider the various types of power produced by the different modes of exchange. Power is the ability to compel others to obey through given communal norms. There are roughly speaking three kinds of communal norms. First, there are the laws of the community. We can call these rules. They are almost never explicitly stipulated, nor are they enforced through penal codes. Nevertheless, violation of these rules leads to ostracism or expulsion, and so violations are rare. Second, we have the laws of the state. We can think of these as laws that exist between communities or within societies that include multiple communities. In spaces in which communal rules no longer hold sway, laws of the state arise as shared norms. Third, we have international law, laws that govern relations between states. In other words, these laws are shared norms that apply in spaces where laws of the state do not hold sway. The relevant types of power differ depending on which of these shared norms is at issue. The important point here is that these shared norms do not bring about power. To the contrary, these shared norms cannot function in the absence of some power. Ordinarily, power is thought to be based in violence. In reality, however, this is true only in the case of the shared norms, laws of the state. For example, within the interior of a community in which rules are effective, there is no need to resort to violence to ensure the functioning of shared norms. This is because another coercive force, one of a different nature from violence, is operational. Let's call this the power of the gift. Mouse describes the self-destructive gift giving known as potlatch in the following terms. And finally, we get to potlatch. But the reason for these gifts and frenetic acts of wealth consumption is in no way disinterested, particularly in societies that practice the potlatch. Between chiefs and their vassals, between vassals and their tenants, through such gifts, a hierarchy is established. To give is to show one's superiority, to be more, to be higher in rank. Magister. To accept without giving in return, or without giving more back, is to become client and servant. To become small, to fall lower, minister. To make a gift is to gain sway over the recipient, because the failure to make a return gift means falling into the status of a dependent. This occurs without the use of violence. If anything, it appears at first glance to be an utterly gratuitous act of benevolence. Nonetheless, it results in the exertion of a control over the other that is even more effective than violent coercion. Mouse believed that the things exchanged also possess a special intrinsic power, which causes them to be given a, to be given and above all to be reciprocated. The Aboriginal Maori people of New Zealand called this power how. I will discuss this again, but what is important to note for present purposes is that the reciprocal mode of exchange is accompanied by its own type of power. Where's the so Maori, don't, don't the people, cut. were the Maori people in New Zealand the ones that Graeber studied? I, I, don't, I, I think so. I think it was the Maori. Because he uh, was, stu- he did study in New Zealand, he, he did field work as an anthropologist uh, in Maori. I, I, you know, he talks about how in New Zealand, um, there were people who had tried to, or maybe it was Madagascar. Maybe it's possible, but I think it was New Zealand talks about people who had tried to, um, live outside of the economy. Right. And that it was a process to get them to actually engage in the economy. And he talks about like these, how they've in large part maintained their old social forms and, you know, he was able to get there, you know, to go there and uh, to witness it. So he t- uses it as examples. For example, 
In a potlatch ceremony, the recipients attempt to overpower their rivals by giving back even more than they have received. Potlatch is not itself welfare, but warfare, but resembles warfare in that the motive behind it is to gain supremacy over one's rivals. There are also cases of gift giving that seem not to follow this tendency. For example, membership in a community is something bestowed as a gift as soon as one is born. Each member bears an obligation to reciprocate for this. The force by which the community constrains each of its members is the force of this sort of reciprocity. For this reason, within the community, there is no particular need to impose penalties in cases where a member violates the norms or rules. Once it is known to the community at large that a member has violated the norms, that is the end. To be abandoned by the community is equivalent to death. In the second instance, occurring outside the domain of a community or in situations in which more than one community exists, the rules of a single community do not apply. Accordingly, the need arises for shared norms, laws, that transcend the community. In order for these to function, however, there must be some force of compulsion. This is actual force or violence. Weber argues that state power is rooted in the monopolization of violence, but not all violence is capable of becoming a force that polices communal norms. In actual practice, the state is established when one community comes to dominate another community through violence. In order to transform this from a single act of plunder into a permanent situation, this domination must be grounded in a set of shared norms that transcends any one community. One that, in other words, must be equally obeyed by the rulers or ruling communities. The state comes into existence at such times. While the power of the state is backed up by violence, that power is always mediated by laws. Just as the force that imposes the rules of a community is rooted in the reciprocal mode of exchange, so too is the force that imposes laws of state rooted in a specific form of exchange. Yeah, Thomas Hobbes was the first to discover this. He saw the basis for the state in a covenant entered into by fear, a contract wherein one receiveth the benefit of life or money or service. This means that the power of the state is something established not solely through violent coercion, but more importantly, also through free consent. If it were only based on violent coercion, its power could not survive for any extended period. Accordingly, what is important here is that the power of the state is rooted in a specific mode of exchange. Third, we have the question of how there came to be laws between states, that is, shared norms existing in realms beyond the reach of state law. Hobbes argues that relations between states exist in a natural condition, a state of nature over which no law can exist. Yet, in reality, trade is carried out between communities, and laws are born of the actual practice of this trade. These are so-called natural laws. They are not merely abstract concepts. Any state that needs to conduct trade cannot afford to ignore them. These are sustained not by the power of the community or state, but rather by a power that is born of commodity exchanges. In concrete terms, the power of money. As Marx stresses, commodity exchange is something that arises between two communities. What took form in this were exchanges carried out through a universal equivalent form, money. This was the result of what Marx calls the joint contribution of the whole world of commodities. We might also call it the social contract between commodities. The state has no hand in this. In reality, if there were no laws of the state, commodity exchange could not take place. In other words, this contract could not be implemented. But the state is unable to produce the sort of power that is generated by money. Money is minted by the state, but its currency is not dependent on the state's authority. Money's currency depends instead on a power that takes form within the world of commodities and their possessors. 
the role of the state or empire, supranational state, extends only to guaranteeing the metallic content of the currency. But the power of money extends beyond the domain of any single empire. Commodity exchange is a form of exchange that takes place by free mutual consent. On this point, commodity exchange differs from the situation of the community or state. But this is also how it produces a form of domination that differs from the state. The power of money. Yep. Well, so can we go back? Uh, so what does he do? So Thomas Hobbes sees that uh, what? That in a, a state society, violence is violence and fear, and then outside back. of <clears throat> outside of a state, uh, there are natural laws, and so natural laws mediate international. Uh, it, yeah, natural laws between mediate states, international laws. Right. Yeah, right. So, it's, according so to only, Hobbes, so really, that's mainly two points. I just don't, I want to. I don't want to mess up. The, the notes here. So there's two points with Hobbes. One is that he sees the role violence, of viol fear. violence behind. Yes. And the other one is just the natural law between states. Okay. Natural law between states. And the reason he brought that up is, is to say, um, no, it's not natural law. It is exchange. It's conditions and relations of exchange that create what gets misrecognized as natural law. Um, because Hobbes, dude, Hobbes is a pessimist. If ever, if anybody else is, man, fuck that guy. Hobbes is fucking. He's really exciting to read. Um, yeah, because when you're reading like this history of like political philosophy, getting to Hobbes for the first time was very like reading being in time for the first time. It's like this dense very technical super serious attempt to uh show the foundations of state and law and all of these different things and usually people just think oh you know he thought that life was brutish and short prior to the state that's usually all people talk about but no he takes like the philosophy the naturalistic philosophy of francis bacon and Really, he just sees us all as like atoms in a void, bouncing around, running from things that we're afraid of, being attracted to things that we are that we find pleasurable. Um, and it's kind of his naturalistic found uh, foundation uh, that leads to utilitarianism later. You get these more democratic yep. and liberal forms yep. of it, but the conception of the human underlying liberalism. Is there in Hobbes, you know? Absolutely, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he's he's really trying to flesh out a a system that accounts for the situation we find ourselves in. And so, it <clears throat> is really interesting to think of a critique of modernity, also being a critique of Hobbes, and then trying to see Hobbes as like the rigorous foundation for a lot of these more like John Locke and John Stuart Mill, like they were all pretty much uh, shaped by the reading of Hobbes as well. You know, so it's, it's fascinating stuff. Anyway, so I was just, yeah, I wanted to make sure I got this. I think that that covers it though. Right, yeah. Natural law exchange, yep. Yeah, the natural law is covering over exchange. <clears throat> Do you, re I mean, he doesn't get into it. Maybe it's not important. I don't remember that section of the Leviathan. I did read the Leviathan, but I don't remember it. It was like, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point. And, uh, what the fuck is the natural law between states? I, well, that's the thing, like natural law. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know specifically, like, I don't know, maybe Karatani is, uh, inferring like natural is law. Is yeah, it like the but, idea is it the idea of like uh, fair exchange is somehow natural? Is that is that what, is that what the is that what Hobbes gets to? I don't know. I just kind of wanted to put that out there. If anyone knows, let us know in the comment section, please. Yeah, I definitely definitely want to go back now. 
because it is all it is all kind of it's the same project man and and we're getting on that bus too and listeners at home or at work or wherever you are you're also on that bus welcome we'll never reach our destination oh it's not god damn it it's a train i keep forgetting <laughs> it's a train i've only ever been on a train once Is that so, on tour? Was that on tour? Yeah. Yeah, I rode the Amtrak. It was yeah. just so cool, dude. It was so cool. I stole a blanket. <laughs> Amtrak, don't hunt me down and send Pinkertons or whatever after me for admitting that I stole a blanket. It's inevitable, dude. AI will eventually report us. Oh, I know. Dude. For We're everything fucked. we've ever said. There, that's the thing about AI. It's like, you know, <laughs> dude. There there are people who hate there are people who hate us. They just don't have time to go through everything we've ever said. But our day of reckoning is coming. As soon as the AI is able to actually dig up every time we've we've been edgy, every time we've ever uh said things in a way that was like not too careful. They're, they're going to make us look like the worst. They're going to make us look like Alex Jones looks on Instagram. You know, like they're going to make Ooh. us look like those clips, man. Ooh. It's a matter which, of time. I mean, which is why being more rigorous is like right now, content like the, the, the current moment, maybe 15, 20 years ago, you could get away with, with being more free and loose and sloppy. And it's not about like, I don't give a shit if I said something offensive whatever i try my best not to be an offensive person that that's ultimately a, you'll never be successful so yes i do care also i don't care what i do care about is the rigor and like that the fact that 20 years ago you could just be oh yeah whatever you know revolution or whatever and you could be like seen as i don't know smart and all that like now, now is the time where people are actually going to have to put up or shut up. And I think it's a good thing. It is scary, but also like, no, uh, the fact that like someone can clip every wrong thing and send it right back and be like, look, you're wrong. You're stupid. Puts more pressure on us to be like, well, you're right. We are stupid. We, we should try our hardest to be right. And I think that's actually a good thing. One more page for you. Commodity exchange is a form of exchange that takes place by free mutual consent. On this point, commodity exchange differs from the situation of the community or state. But this is also how it produces a form of domination that differs from the state. The power of money is a right that money and its owner holds vis-a-vis -vis a commodity and its owner. <clears throat> money is a privileged pledge that can be exchanged at any time for any commodity. As a result, unlike commodities themselves, money can be accumulated. The accumulation of wealth begins not in the storing up of products, but in the accumulation of money. By contrast, a commodity that is never exchanged for money in many cases ceases to be a commodity. It is discarded. Because a commodity has no guarantee that it will enter into an exchange, the owner of money enjoys an overwhelmingly su superior position. Herein lies the reason for the desire to accumulate money as well as for its active implementation, that is, for the birth of capital. The power of money is different from the power that is based in gift exchanges or violence. Without having to resort to physical or mental coercion of the other, this power is exercised through exchanges based on mutual consent. Hence, for example, forcing a slave to work is different from making a laborer work through wages. But this power of money also brings about a kind of class domination that differs from the class status domination that was grounded in violence. It should be clear now that every mode of exchange produces its own unique form of power, and moreover, that types of power differ in accordance with differences in modes of exchange. 
the three types of power discussed exist in various combinations of every social formation, just as all social formations are combinations of the three modes of exchange. Finally, we must add a fourth power in addition to the three already mentioned. This would be the form of power that corresponds to mode of exchange D. In my view, this type was first manifested in universal religions in the form of the power of God. Modes of exchange A, B, and C, as well as the types of power that derive from them, will stubbornly continue to survive. It is impossible to resist them. It is for this reason that mode of exchange D appears not so much as something deriving from human desires or free will, but in the form of a categorical imperative that transcends them. Bum, bum, ba, dum. So what are the, there's the power of the gift. Um, there's the power of, I mean, what did he have, you know, names for each of these powers? So, I don't, he, I don't think he actually had clear names. So the power of the gift is belonging you belong to the tribe or a group or whatever um you what's at stake is expulsion that is the power of the gift yep uh the power of plunder is the threat of violence Power of plunder. Safety slash violence. Or there safety slash threat of violence. Um, no, and then okay, here, I like the way so the way I'm putting on the whiteboard is power of yeah. A equals belonging and then in parentheses versus expulsion. I like putting the verses there. And so then power yeah, yeah. of B would be safety versus threat. I like that a lot. Yeah. Okay. The power, power of, C. of C, commodity, would be um, stability, social existence um, versus um, poverty, dejection, destitution. Is um, that right? That's what he just yeah, said. Yeah. Well, so, so power sounds of money is, like is that stability does sound a lot like safety, but also with with plunder, it specifically the fucking Lord will just kill you or he'll send his mm -hmm. homies with their sp spikes and shields and shit to cut your head off. Whereas <laughs> in capitalism or whatever in capitalism, um, it, it, it is safety, but it's not like. It's not like King Biden is going to send the executioner to cut your head off. It is like you're going to go through this this process that's both material and social of destitution, of poverty. So you you have stability. And the reason, I, I guess the way he says it here, the power of the commodity is money. So we want money because money is self-valorizing. So we have a commodity in abundance, right? We we're born... With a lifetime supply of the commodity that is labor power. So we don't want the commodity. We want money because money can self-valorize. We want to get rid of our commodities in exchange for money to move up the ladder. But the power that enforces that is, well, that is the power. Um, but I guess to go a little bit more Hobbesian, the fear there is destitution, is poverty, is not just physical death, but also social death. So it is like a commingling of A and B. Not to say that it's directional, not to say that Dude, it necessarily yes. follows. Yeah, well, but, but it is being but being homeless puts yeah. you in a in a dangerous situation. Uh yeah. being ex, ex expulsion also still is part of things because you could get shut out of the job market. People could say, Don't hire yeah. this person. Yeah. So it, it it's like a weird uh it's like a weird chimera. I'm putting um money versus labor power commodity and then threat slash expulsion still there. 
Now, of course, yeah, because also all of these forms, he already said that all of these forms exist in all of these. So then that makes me think that we could go back to power of B safety versus threat. And then we could sit here and go, okay, but is there still like destitution and expulsion there is. in so, that society? So, okay. Yeah. So, so specifically with the commodity, it is the money versus commodity that that is what's really going on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and erase the threat versus expulsion down there. Cause as soon as I wrote that, I was like, well, then we have to do that to all of them. Cause I don't want to. Yeah. Because that's the yeah. thing, right? Like our mind does want to go there. I think my mind wants to go there being, you know, good little, you know, modern, uh, caring leftists, whatever. I, I want to talk about the coercion that we face, but that's not what Kiritani is talking about. Kiritani is talking about the, the unique characteristics of the systems themselves. Right. right and that right. is in this case, the money versus commodity you have an abundance of the commodity we want to get rid of all our commodities in exchange for money that is what is going on that's what enforces it i'm gonna run downstairs and, and grab my uh cup of coffee i'll be right back i'm listening though word and then in in d it is the power of god that is posited um as the, the specific mode of power. But he doesn't really get into that. He just says, power of God he moves on because he's saving that for later. Um, shit. But yeah, it's uh, mode of exchange D, not as something deriving from human desire or free will, but in the form of a categorical, categorical imperative that transcends them. So basically, um it is this thing that i guess is easy to express in religious terminology but doesn't have to necessarily be religious but it is something that is outside of you know our our normal human constraints it, it is this thing that it's either the power of god or it's this categorical imperative of this there's this ideal that we can't fuck with Nevertheless, it exists and it's true. It's the kite on the string and you have to hold on to the string. Um, this is cool because like, like yesterday I wrote like seven pages in defense of thinking seriously about ideals. And I'll be getting into this mm. uh, with my lecture on Sunday where, you know, we... We do, we are the creatures for whom our being is an issue. Part of that means that um, we have to be oriented in the world, have to have an, a sense of where we've been and where we're going. Part of what gives us that orientation is our ideals. And these ideals are, uh, we could say that they are social, uh, they are forms of social mediation. Um, so for instance, there is the ideal brother or sister or father or mother or son or daughter or uncle or aunt or grandfather or grandmother. Now, those are all ideals that come out of the family unit. What kinds of ideals come out of a community? What kinds of ideals come out of a culture or a society? Um, different, obviously, a social order kind of will bring about like the idea of you know, the, you could go down the line of all these different kinds of ideals. You would have the hero. You would have the, uh, the, the person who, who intervenes and helps or, you know, the, the proactive neighbor. Well, I guess neighbors more at the level of community, but at this sort of social level, social cultural level, we could talk about like the ideal American, right? Anyway, we just have all these different levels that bring in these various ideals. And part of living the examined life is fleshing out your relation to these ideals. And you can basically deconstruct them and say that they're all socially constructed bullshit. Um, but that's actually seeding or disavowing your, the responsibility that we actually have for taking overly simplistic and ambiguous um, complicated ideas that we live in reference to and then being like, Oh, I'm not going to take it seriously. It's like, well, that doesn't change the fact that you live in reference to it. Like the punk 
you know, the 15 year old punk who hates the society they live in and doesn't respect any of its ideals, doesn't realize that there are lots of different versions of those ideals and that this person has a very simplistic idea of those ideals that is probably itself a misrecognition of his parents and their, or the teachers and their, you know, it's like, well, is your small town where you grew up or, you know, the, the, the suburbs where you grew up, like it, it, you know, your teachers, your parents, even if you have a correct understanding of what they have in mind with these ideals, does that really totalize and reduce the uh, possibilities of these ideals? Right. And so this is, this is complicated for me because I, 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 I felt like I, for some years, bracketed out the problem or the, yeah, complexity and problem of ideals in human life. Uh, and I did this by way of deconstruction. I did this by way of materialism. I did this by way of this and that and the other, but we still live in reference to these things and the, the, you can't be outside of reference to them and they're not merely subjective and they're not purely relative. Um, what's any, any, anything that you can understand is relative to these ideals. Um, the question is, is like, which ones should be prioritized and how, and, uh, how can they be, um, made to fit together or if they're not to go together, then why? But those are, those are serious problems. And that's why I wrote seven pages on it is because I'm just starting to try to think about this. But, um, yeah, the power of D, um, some kind of ideal conception can be a real unifier for people, but all past conceptions that are the symbols for lost wars or ossified movements that people try to revive and maybe get a little steam here and there. Um, I, I don't know if they'll ever be it, I, whether it's the Catholic church or it's the, you know, communist international or the, you know, Oh, maybe we could make national socialism, but like the good kind. It's like, I, I just don't think that any of the things that have gone on before is going to be the solution. But that does that mean that the new ideal thing has to negate all of those things? Does it have to? Um, can it appeal to the higher uh, angels of, of each of those things? Um, I don't know. That seems like a complicated problem. And I wouldn't trust anybody who has a really quick answer to it. Anybody who's just like, yes, yes, here's how we do it. I'd be like, I don't trust you. Anybody who says, no, absolutely not. We absolutely can't do that. I'd just be like, I don't trust you. I just, I'm sorry, but here we go. I just don't trust anybody like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say that that is, I think, the one quick answer um, is that it's, it's, it's a complex um, system. <clears throat> it'll be a complex. And, and I think it, it'll necessarily be an ongoing solution. Uh, if you even want to call it a solution, I, I think it'll be a non-solution in that it will be a process because that process itself will be filled out by the human lives that posit the problem in the first place. Like, that's the thing. People want these black and white, these very uh, mathematic or algebraic um, solutions to things. When in reality, no, it, it, it will necessarily be a complex process. And that's the only like, and that is a short answer and it might seem like it's a non-answer but i actually think it's the answer is is the fact that like no it, it's it's going to have to be something that is filled out by its by its very participants um and i think someone who isn't in this conversation might hear that and say oh you're trying to avoid the question you're trying to brush it off when in reality no i think that's the only way to face it head on is to leave it open ended like the process that it necessarily is. <clears throat> Just finishing adding the notes here. Um, so power of D did you say he said it's God? Is that what? Yeah. Power of God. Okay. He, yeah. He put in, in scare quotes, God. power of God. 
Okay. Well, I'll put it or in categorical, uh, categorical, categorical imperative. I feel like which this I is actually where, like. This is where he'll get the most pushback for sure. Um, but I, I think I know what he's doing, so I think I like it. And uh, yeah. Cool. All right, I'll read for a bit. The concept of intercourse. This is where he's going to show, you know what? He's not such a deviation from Marx. In fact, he's really sticking close to the notes. The concept of intercourse. My rethinking of history from the perspective of modes of exchange rather than modes of production clearly represents a departure from the common wisdom of Marxism. However, it is not necessarily a departure from Marx. I am taking exchange in a broad sense, just as the early Marx used the concept of intercourse, Verkehr, in a broad sense. For example, in the German ideology, we find the word intercourse used in the following four passages. With money, every form of, of intercourse and intercourse itself becomes fortuitous for the individuals. Thus, money implies that all intercourse up till now was only intercourse of individuals under particular conditions, not of individuals as individuals. The next extension of the division of labor was the separation of production and intercourse, the formation of a special class of merchants. The form of intercourse determined by the exit. These are all different quotes. So that's two quotes so far. There's two more quotes. So this is the third one. The form of intercourse determined by the existing productive forces at all previous historical stages and in its turn determining these is civil society. The latter, as is clear from what we have said before, or the way of what we have said above, has as its premise and basis the simple family and the multiple, called the tribe, and the more precise definition of the society is given in our remarks above. Next, final quote. With the conquering barbarian people, war itself is still, as indicated above, a regular form of intercourse. As these examples show, the concept of intercourse here includes occurrences within a given community, such as a family or tribe, as well as trade taking place between communities and even war. This is what it means to take exchange in a broad sense. Moses Hess was the first to put forward this concept of intercourse. Slightly older than Marx, he was a philosopher of the young Hegelian school, the left Hegelians. Hess was the first to transform and expand Ludwig Feuerbach's critique of religion, theory of self-alienation, into a critique of state and capital. In Hess's book, On the Essence of Money, 1845, he proposed the concept of intercourse using it to grasp the relations between man and nature and between man and man. Hess first argues that life is the exchange of productive life activities. He continues, the intercourse of men is the human workshop wherein individual men are able to realize and manifest their life or powers. The more vigorous their intercourse, the stronger also their productive power, and so far as their intercourse is restricted, their productive power is restricted likewise. Without their life medium, without the exchange of their particular powers, individuals do not live. The intercourse of men does not originate from their essence. It is their real essence. I think he's saying that everybody is, at base, gay. That's, that's, <laughs> so, that's what he's saying. You could actually... I think you could actually like make a legitimate argument for that. Like if well, then you would have to redefine gay and you have to like Okay, okay. But okay. I like I don't think that's <laughs> as as like uh shallow a joke as it might appear on on the surface. It's and just that it's the, whole, the whole the whole the like, whole <laughs> I meant it to be shallow because it's just saying intercourse between men. It's the fundamental yeah. thing. It's the basis of everything. 
And then we could say, ah, but, but the repre the repression <laughs> of that attraction is the thing that leads to the creation of so many amazing. Yeah, no. You wouldn't even have to take it there. You could just say that, like, if you define gay as like this uh, necessarily like necessary com communal thing where love comes comes in like love and belonging and stuff like that like comes into it then yeah like we necessarily are all gay at that level there I, just, I don't there. think people use gay that way <laughs> I don't yeah. I, I just uh uh I know there was just was like, like this, an onion there, there was just like it this 14 year old it all started with this 14 year old version of me that was just like man that sounds pretty gay and then I was like well that would be and then I just started going through these different levels of the joke you know but yeah, it's fun. It's it's fun. Anyway, I, I was like not going to say anything. And then I was like, dude, we're on the Internet. I just have to. So anyway, we're on the Internet. Um, So this is cool, though, because I've seen intercourse used in this anthropological way because Claude Levi Strauss uses it in this way. Um, I didn't know it came from one of the young Hegelians. That's really cool. Fuck yeah, Moses Hess. In Hess's view, the relation of man and nature is intercourse. More concretely, it is metabolism or material exchange. In German, Wetzel literally means exchange, so that the relation of humans to nature is one of intercourse or exchange. This is an important point when we consider... Scroll. This is an important point when we consider Marx's natural history perspective, as well as when we consider environmental problems. Hess next points out that this sort of relation between man and nature necessarily takes place by way of a certain kind of social relation between people. This too consists of a kind of intercourse. In this case, Hess cites as modes of intercourse plunder, murder for gain, slavery, and the traffic in commodities. In his view, as traffic in commodities expands, this mode replaces plunder and slavery, that is, the use of violence to steal the products of others or to force them to labor. Yet, in the end, this amounts to carrying them out in another form, through the means of money. This is because a person who possesses money is able to coerce others. In this, the various capabilities of people are alienated from them in the form of money. Moreover, the division and coordination of people's labor come to be organized by capital regardless of their intention. Hess believed that a truly communal form of intercourse would become possible only after the passing of the capitalist economy. Since in a capitalist system people carry out cooperative enterprises under the sway of capital, they need to abolish the capital that is their own self-alienation and manage their cooperative production according to their own wills in order to see the realization of an organic community. This is another name for what Pierre Joseph Proudhon proposed as associations or cooperative production. In a sense, Marx too held... My boy Proudhon! In a sense, Marx too held to this view throughout his life that Marx, at the stage of the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts 1844, was influenced by Hess's theory of intercourse is obvious. And as the quoted passages show, this carried over to the German ideology as well. But after this, as Marx plunged deeply into the specialized study of economics, he began to limit his use of the word intercourse to its ordinary meaning. This cannot be detached from the fact that in Capital, he focused exclusively on research into one form of intercourse, that of the capitalist economy that was established with the expansion of trade, commodity exchanges, between communities. Most likely, this is what led him to give only secondary consideration to the domains of state, community, and nation. But rather than criticize Marx for this, we should devote ourselves to the task of extending the work Marx carried out in capital into the domains of state and nation. Beginning from its foundational mode of exchange, commodity exchange, Marx ex explicated the totality of the complexities of the capitalist economic system. Far from being the material base, this capitalist economic system, woven out of money and credit, is something more akin 
to a religious world whose existence is based on faith, in other words, credit. It is not something that can be explained solely through the capitalistic mode of production. The same is true for state and nation. They may appear to be merely ideological or abstract, but they are rooted in fundamental modes of exchange, just as is the capitalist system, the state in mode of exchange B and the nation in mode of exchange A. These are not simply ideological or representations. The modern capitalist economy, state, and nation historically took shape through the combination and subsequent modification of the fundamental modes of exchange. Pounding out those notes. So what do you got for those pages, 15 through 17? Just real short. Um, <clears throat> human interactions, the concept of intercourse. Human interactions embodied in economic, social, economic slash social, behaviors slash arrangements slash involvement. In brackets, pulls several codes from Marx to define intercourse. Hess defines intercourse in On the Essence of Money as the relation between man and nature and man and man, also metabolism. Uh, page 16, exchange is an inter and intercourse. Uh, Proudhon called, the, called this association. Marx bracketed out other types of intercourse in favor of analyzing capitalist relations of production. And then page 17, the modern capitalist state is a concoction mixed and I'm gonna just it is a is a mixture of all the preceding uh, forms of exchange. Love it, beautiful, well done. So, we're a little over halfway. I'm gonna keep reading a bit here. Exchange between man and nature. In order to deal with state, nation, and capital comprehensively, we must rethink them from starting from exchange, broadly defined, that is, from the concept of intercourse. Moreover, replacing the concept of production with that of exchange has special signification today. As I noted, Marx's emphasis on the concept of production arose because his fundamental understanding of humanity situated it within its relation to nature. This is something he learned from Hess seeing it as metabolism, in other words, as exchange. Why is this of importance? For example, when we produce something, we modify raw materials, but at the same time, we also generate unnecessary waste products and waste heat. Okay, I would definitely make a note here that the reason that Marx's reliance on Hess in his early days matters is because we need to understand that production, that is modifying nature, necessarily creates waste. He's going to show how Marx actually agrees with that. Um, that's not just him being an environmentalist and going back and putting that on Marx. No, it's Marx. Marx was aware of this, um, but this is also obviously very important for um, everything you want to do with waste. Seen from the perspective of metabolism, these sorts of waste products must be reprocessed. When microorganisms in the soil reprocess waste products and make them reusable, for example, we have the sort of ecosystem found in the natural world. More fundamentally, the Earth's environment is a cyclical system that circulates air and water and finally exports entropy into outer space in the form of waste heat. If this circulation were blocked, there would be an accumulation of waste products or of entropy. The material exchanges, Stoffbeschel, between man and nature are one link within the material exchanges from that form the total Earth system. Human activity is sustainable when it relies on the sort of natural circulation to obtain its resources and recycle its waste products. Until the beginning of capitalist industrial production, 
human production did not result in any major disruption of the natural ecosystem. Waste products generated by people were processed by nature, a system of material exchanges, metabolism, between man and nature. In general, however, when we consider production, we tend to forget about its waste products. Only its creativity is considered. The production we find in the work of philosophers such as Hegel follows this pattern. I would just make a note about how um, everything in uh, economics called externalities or, or kind of under the header of externalities is waste. Like that's really what we're talking about. I don't think they like the word waste. You know, it makes it makes them sound wasteful. So they say externalities. Those are things outside of the system. Those are incidental or accidental downstream effects. Even Marxists. Yeah. Wait, oh, yeah. I was, I was going to say this. When I got here, this I perked up, dude. Um, <clears throat> it is it is the case. Every every process has an output um everything everything generates heat everything like like the world the atoms the matter like even if you're engaged in a productive process that generates no observable heat you're still generating or uh generates no observable waste like you're still generating waste in the form of of heat you're still generating waste your body is generating waste and the calories you burn that don't go into the action you're doing that go into like everything, everything creates waste. Everything creates a product, which due to context can be seen as useful or desirable. And it also produces a product that due to context is seen as undesirable or incidental or waste everything. Which is why I, I I do think it needs to be brought to the forefront um, <clears throat> of production and human congress, human intercourse, human dealings, all these things. Um, but it, yeah, getting here, I was like, oh, hell yeah, dude, this dude's waste pilled. Fuck yeah. Tight, 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 yeah. Even Marxists who attacked this sort of Hegelian thought as idealism failed to see production in materialist terms. They failed to think of production as something inevitably accompanied by the generation of waste products and waste heat. As a result, they could only think of production as something positive and believed that any evil in it must be the result of human exploitation or of class domination. Right, which is also why you get people thinking, oh yeah, well, if we just had socialism, then the, we'd be sustainable. Or people who think supply uh, consumer side activism matters or people who think degrowth is a good idea. Like, yes, it, it does come from this very simplistic, very reductionistic, very moralistic view <clears throat> and moralistic in the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. We love moralism in the right way, the mysterious third way. As a result, <laughs> that, that we might change our podcast name from Capital Mondays to the mysterious third way. <laughs> the mysterious third option. Yeah. yeah. As a result, that would piss, Marx off, that would piss off a lot of people. That would piss off <laughs> uh, like contemporary progressives um, who were like, no, they're no, you, the mysterious third way. It would also piss off like reactionary traditionalists because they already tried to like, they already tried to own like the third way thing. So oh, it would piss everybody true. off. That's true. That's true. You know what? I wasn't even thinking. I was just saying it. You're right. There's like this extra connotation there. I'm glad you said that. As a result, <laughs> as a result, Marxists in general have been naively positive in their view of progress and productive power and scientific technology. Accordingly, criticisms of Marxists have made made by ecologists are not off the mark. But we cannot say the same for Marx himself. In Capital, he points out that capitalists 
agriculture, disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and the earth, as in, it prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. Hence, it hinders the operation of the eternal natural condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. His source here was the German chemist Justus von Liebig, the originator of chemical fertilizer agriculture as well as its first critic. He was the first to advocate a return to a circulation-based system of agriculture. Marx writes, Moreover, all progress in capitalist agriculture is a progress in the art, not only of robbing the worker, but of robbing the soil. All progress in increasing the fertility of the soil for a given time is progress towards ruining the more long-lasting sources of that fertility. The more a country proceeds from large-scale industry as the background of its development, as in the case of the United States, the more rapid is this process of destruction. Capitalist production, therefore, only develops the techniques and the degree of combination of the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the original sources of all wealth, the soil, and the worker. End quote. Here Marx criticized not only capitalism's exploitation of workers, but also its exploitation of nature, which destroys the natural balance of soil and humans. He moreover argues that the moral of the tale, which can also be extracted from other discussions of agriculture, is that the capitalist system runs counter to a, a rational agriculture, or that a rational agriculture is incompatible with the capitalist system, even if the latter promotes technical development in agriculture, and needs not either small farmers working for themselves or the control of the associated producers. What he has in mind here is neither large-scale capitalist super farms nor large state-run collective farms. Marx is arguing that the managing of agriculture should be carried out by associations, federations, of small-scale producers. Which I appreciate because I do not, I always resent the, the big city Marxists who want to do away with small, uh, small time farmers. I have, I mean, honestly, if, if the options are barbarism or a kind of socialism that does away with the small farmer, I choose barbarism. I would rather get swallowed by the sun and we all die. So long as a few people get to have their little farms up until like the final moments, because there's something special about small farms. I just, I just defend them. Um, and I don't just defend them because, uh, some nostalgic idea. Um, my mom has been researching the, uh, market garden movement and the polyface farming movement and all of these things that are relatively new. They're, None of them are older than 50 years. They're all new ways of doing old things that, you know, selectively use certain kinds of technologies to really, uh, to do a lot on a small plot of land. But beyond all of that, there is just the freedom means nothing if it doesn't mean that some people get to go and do that, right? It's like, don't, don't tell me that you care about a society uh, that is going to bring freedom if it doesn't mean that people get to actually be stewards of the earth, care for the soil, oversee um, this, this, this bringing into life so many different kinds of things that are in relation to one another. The kind of knowledge necessary, the generalist knowledge um, that is theoretical and practical to be able to understand the world uh, in, in its seasons with the local place, with all of the different species of flora and fauna, that and to, like that is a uh, an amazing kind of knowledge that one can have. I would, I think it is a, probably a liberal art. I, I think it's not a. I, I don't think it's. I mean, it's obviously not traditionally taught as a liberal art, but um, usually it's like, oh, we're gonna go homestead, and we're gonna go, and it's you know like libertarians going off to do it, and it's like cool, you know, but like the impulse is onto something. And, uh, 
I don't know. I just, I don't think that impulse is going to go away. You know, that I don't think that I want to live in a world that is prime, that is only based in that kind of production or whatever. Um, we need soy, we need wheat, we need all kinds of, uh, crops that have to be mass produced, but carrots are always better local when they come from real soil, from real people who feel responsible for them. And if you've never eaten parrot, uh, carrots, like from my mom's farm, you'll never understand. But I put a cherry tomato in Nance's hand and said, try that. And it blew his that fucking mind. was like a great dude. Yeah. Like that was the sweetest tomato I've ever had. Seriously. Yeah. You just uh, can't mass produce that. It doesn't work. Yeah. And with, I don't know, with thinking about agricultural production, um, I think it, it is kind of easy to just think, oh yeah, we can totally instrumentalize that and, um, <clears throat> and we'll be okay. And it, I think, sure, that, that'll get you maybe, maybe 80% of the way there. Um, but we, it's food. What are, what are we functionally? We're machines for producing waste. Like functionally, I mean, functionally, we're many other things too. We're also machines for reproducing ourselves and blah, blah, blah. But like at a, at a base level, we are machines that consume plants and other animals and shit them out. So to, to just act like, it, and I, I don't, I, I don't really care about food. I, I don't like food and I think part of it is due to the, like, just the fact that I don't have access to great, awesome food all the time. Like, I'm an American. I, like, I could go out of my way. I There was a time in my life when I did go out of my way to make sure I, I did have fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and I put, put a lot of time and energy into food. And now I'm kind of over it. Now I'm at the point where I don't really give a shit. I'm going to eat. I'm going to shit it out later. Um, but food, food is such such a huge part of what we are and how we see ourselves in relation to the world it situates us in the world and to take out the human element in in the process to take out the creativity to take out the love the joy the pleasure um because like i don't enjoy food all that much i mean there's sometimes i eat food and i'm like yeah this is good but whatever but i really do enjoy the communal aspect of meals like when you're yeah. sitting around, like it's it's just such a huge part of what we think of as human human life, love and joy, um, and all these things. And to think that can be totally instrumentalized, you're missing the point, dude. I don't want to wake up, put on a gray jumpsuit, suit, eat the the goo, and go to work at the factory. I don't want to do that. I want to be a human. I want to maintain my agency. I want to honor my singularity and the singularity of all the others around me. And food is a part of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, your mom is doing really cool experimental shit. That's like blew my mind going there and like talking, she's talking about all this, like literally you said it, new technologies. Like she's, she's co-developing new technologies with the wider community of people that are doing this type of <clears throat> the internet. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, and it, it, yeah, to, I, it, it pisses me off because there is a very superficial version of the environmentalist who just wants degrowth, um, who just wants consumer side activism, like who, who just wants these things, but they don't actually really give a shit. They, they go to Whole Foods anyway, and they, you know, they're, they're fair trade vegan, but they shop at Whole Foods. It's like, dude, again, again. It's all symbolic. Anyway, it doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day unless you're the one out there producing the food for yourself. But it just it, I think it's easy to to fall into one of the sides of that divide where it's, yeah, I need my red meat and I have a diesel truck that spits out black smoke or also to be like, well, look how awesome I am. I bought a electric vehicle and I only eat lettuce. And it's like, dude, you guys are both missing the point. Like there there's actually quite a bit of fertile ground in that uh 
conversation and everyone is pissing in the river and it, it's annoying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you said that you thought the two best meals from tour were, uh, my mm -hmm. mom's enchiladas and Anne's <clears throat> and Anne's peanut, peanut butter noodles or whatever. Peanut noodles. Yeah, she made some like peanutty noodle yeah. dish is. Yeah. It, that, that was at Andrew Flores's house. Um, that was, yeah, guys, it, it, it's a thing people can feel called to do. There is mm. nothing, nothing in Anne's upbringing that, uh, groomed her to become a person who loves to cook. There's also nothing in her society. Like she did not grow up on like some era of fiction that promoted this idea of the barefoot like wife who just like spends all day in the kitchen. Uh, she didn't grow up with uh, a, a Hollywood image that gave her that idea. She didn't, uh, she definitely didn't get it in school and she definitely didn't get it at home. Uh, you know, her dad likes to bake. Her mom and dad both cook. Um, you know, everybody cooks in that family. It's just a normal thing that humans do. She just happens to be like the one out of the family who loves it the most. Like it means the most mm -hmm. to her. Um, and being a vegan is part of what put her in tune with it because she had to take more responsibility for her food. And it kind of reminded her of, oh, yeah, I actually I enjoy this. Um, but what I'm saying is I'm, I kind of had to clarify, like, this is not something that was, you know, schooled into her or anything like right. that. She just literally feels this passion for food and for nutrition. And I think the war, the world is poorer without people who feel that way, being able to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah, then we're just eating, we're wearing the gray jumpsuits, we're eating the gruel, and we're working at the dick sucking factory, and, and that's it. That's life. <clears throat> that's intercourse. Life. Intercourse between men. That's what I was talking about. This, man. this is the future <laughs> liberals want. <Ugh>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, seen from this perspective, Marx's thesis in critique of the Gotha program should be clear. The Gotha program was adopted as party platform upon the inauguration of the German Social Democratic Party with the support of both the Marx and LaSalle factions. Upon reading it, though, Marx privately mounted a biting critique. One of the platform's key points lay in the assertion, based in Ferdinand LaSalle's thought, that labor was the source of all wealth and civilization. Marx rebuts this. Labor is not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much the source of use values, and it is surely of such that material wealth consists. As labor, which itself is only the manifestation of a force of nature, human labor power. See, this is what I'm talking about. There's Marx using human labor power not as a commodity. He's saying it's a force of nature. Uh, can you clip that and share that in the in the notes right there and just put? Yeah, because this is what I was getting to earlier when I was talking about this, and you were saying no, yeah, the, because it, it, this is a thing. We 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 fluctuate between using labor power as the commodity and using labor power as something else, and it's th this is the capacity to labor. Like that's this, yeah. This is, this is the standing reserve of labor. The standing reserve yep. of labor means that it's on call as labor power. The thing is, is a slave is a part of that standing reserve of labor power on call. They're just not. They're not doing it through this sort of consensual way or whatever. They're not making themselves into that and putting themselves on the market. They, it was forced. Yeah, that's actually that is it. It's the the condition of possibility. <clears throat> yeah, so I would even go all the way back up to where I'd made that note because so I was gaslighting myself. Ultimately, I was just like, "Oh yeah, no, I'm right." And Pistone gets into why it's complicated, um, because Marx seems to vacillate on this 
I think he's a little bit back and forth on his usage of labor and labor power, where he's sometimes transhistoricizing, sometimes he's talking in, a, in this particular capitalist way. Um, Dude, it's just like people who want to read Marx and do this originalist thing are missing. No, like that's not that's not what Marx is, is doing. Marx is trying to figure this shit out. Uh, and people who want to. I don't know, just make reference back to all of Marx's writings <clears throat> and treat it as, you know, inspired scripture uh is insane and and that's not even not only is that like contradictory to what marx is doing like it's wrong on that level but then also take into account the fact that uh all of marx's work has been so heavily censored by the or was so heavily censored by the soviet union like those people aren't even won't even ever admit that they will they, they will oh yeah it, stalin Everything Stalin said is correct. Everything Lenin said is correct. They'll do the whole like, they read it so we don't have to think. They'll pick their guy. Yeah. Yeah. Where am I? Whereas I feel like we're reading Marx along with all these others in that that critical spirit. Um. God, yeah, dude, I, oh, I can't wait to do more with Daniel and and to really go hard on the her hermeneutics. Uh, Ooh, that's exciting. Shout out. shout out to Daniel Garner. We know yeah. you're listening to this. Yeah. Dude. Yo, what's up, Daniel? You're my, you're my new road dog. Um, you give me so much energy. I'm so, so grateful for what you've given already. And I'm looking forward to more and more and more. Um, but yeah, dude, just reading, 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 reading. Dude, I made a fucking awesome clip of him talking about reading um, recently. Uh, I just, it's going to go up uh, as a short on my, well, not on YouTube, because that, then it would have to be like under a minute long, but it'll be on TikTok and Instagram in its full form where he's, on, where he's talking about reading. That, that shit was so awesome. Okay. Uh Identifying human labor as the ultimate source of value is precisely the view of industrial capitalism. Marx is critical here of the view that puts industrial cap production at the center, a view shared not only by LaSalle, but also by most members of the Marx faction at the time. In this, we see the continuing relevance of the natural history perspective that sees man and nature in terms of metabolism, which have been part of Marx's thought since the beginning. Now, I would just add that this is still a projection from the standpoint of capitalist society. So he's still projecting labor power out. This is, you know, it's why time energy has to be thought of as the precondition for what becomes labor power, which is what time energy is seen as from this political economic perspective. But Marx is still critical of the way that Marxists of his time, as well as these Lothalians, we're saying that labor is the source of all wealth, but obviously, no nature also. Right, because the, the economizing standpoint just tends to do this. Oh, that's an externality. And at the time, they just weren't <laughs> even thinking about it. And he was like, guys, you're not thinking about the conditions of possibility here. It's nature. And of course, he just says, oh, yeah, well... Labor power is just our natural capacity to labor. And it's like, yeah, well, what about our natural capacities to do more than just labor? And it's because he's just thinking, well, calories burn, that's labor. Your mm -hmm. stomach digests, that's labor. And it's like, well, I'd rather say that, that, it, that that's your body doing a kind of work, but I want to keep labor in this special human sense where, I'm sorry, labor is something I have to do. I uh, the 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 me who uh has agency has to do things that's that's where we get into labor um obviously there's heteronymous versus autonomous versus cooperative but you know well and i th yeah I, I think it, it's just it's been so muddled but this this idea of socially necessary of social reproduction 
I think that can help us highlight um, how we want to use the term. I don't think, yeah, there, there's never going to be an ultimate end all be all usage of the term, but for the way we want to use it, um, using social reproduction as the kind of uh, the thing that distinguishes work from labor is a pretty good hermeneutic, I think. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you could problematize that as well. But yeah, we we work or we are productive or we are expending energy and effort and force and facing resistance. There's so many different ways to articulate it. And it's just for anyone to think it's as simple as labor. Mm. It's like, come on, dude. You, come on, dude. We're we're actually trying to take this seriously. We're not just mm -hmm. trying to perform the thing. In this, we see the continuing relevance of the natural history perspective that sees man and nature in terms of metabolism, which had been part of Marx's thought since the beginning. In addition, Marx rejects the LaSalle faction's proposal to have the state promote producer cooperatives. In Marx's view, the point was not to have the state foster associations, but rather to have the development of associations lead to the disappearance of the state. In reality, though, when Marxists have seized power, they have generally organized producer cooperatives through the state, whether in the form of collective farms or of people's communes. While you write that, you had also said that Marx is aware of the fact that reducing all value to nothing more than human labor power is exactly what capital does and wants us to do. Yet he is also um, talking about, yeah, he also simultaneously naturalizes labor power, um, must be teased out in time energy theory. Dave. All right. I just wanted to make sure to have that note in there. Widespread. That's good. Cause. I, I think that's one that we it'd be easy to skip over because we think again from our perspective getting getting stuck in that this is this is not just a conversation we are having we yeah. are the ones having it for the moment um but it's not just self-contained <clears throat> so it is important to always point out when we're being a little less clear than we should be Widespread awareness of the significance of this metabolism and material exchange arose only after the adoption of fossil fuels, especially oil. The use of these fuels meant that metabolism was no longer a problem limited to the realms of agriculture and land. Oil is the new is the raw material for detergents, fertilizers, and other chemical products. In addition to being an energy source. The industrial waste products generated in these uses have unleashed global, uh, getting cut off, worldwide environmental problems. As I noted, the dis the what, sorry, what, where am I? The global environment is a kind of heat engine. Oh, he says, as I, as I noted, the global environment is a kind of heat engine. Okay, cool. A cyclical system is maintained by using the processes of atmospheric and water circulation with entropy finally exported to outer space in the form of waste heat. Disruptions in the cycle will unavoidably lead to environmental crises such as climate change and desertification. And ultimately, accumulated entropy will lead the global environment to heat death. Do you want that, Ryan? Do you want heat death? Do you? Want the whole planet to burn up? No. I don't think you do. That's why we have to read this. Papa has to read. He's mad at me because he doesn't think I have to read. <laughs> he wants me to chase him. He wants me to play with him. But he doesn't understand that he doesn't get the bits if I don't go to work. <laughs> and that if I keep working, the planet's going to burn up. So he just doesn't mm -hmm. get it. He doesn't get it. Someone needs to teach my cat English. Come on, Brian. Cat sign. We saw dog sign. 
Yeah. <laughs> you need to get some cat sign, Ryan. Gotta get some cat sign in here. The situation <laughs> is brought about by man's exploitation of nature. Are you referencing the short that I put up or the meme that I sent you this morning? Uh, the, the meme. Sign. The meme. Okay. Yeah. Did you see the short version? Uh-uh. Oh my God. Do you is it a video or is it different? Yeah. Pull it up. Play it. Here, I'll pull it up on, Wait, on the screen share. I have to, I have to, you can't play it cause you're, you're, uh, you're oh, I can, <clears throat> hold on. I can share sound. Oh, you can. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Yeah, share sound. Yeah, no, I just, I, why not? Why not play it? Uh, since we brought up dog sign, I, I don't care. Let's do it. Otherwise you'll have to watch it on your own later. All right, everybody. This is your moment of comic comedic relief. By the way, that right there, Memory Palace by uh, Vanishing Mediators, that is a really, that's probably my favorite skit that Nick has done to date. He's making fun that of tech good, bros with their, with their morning routines. That one I was really good. At, I, woke at, I wake up at 2 a.m. every morning and I strap on my, my uh, what is he, his, his oxygen and he breathes uh, Icelandic walrus farts and then he puts then he puts his legs up behind his head and he enters his memory palace yeah and the other guy's like he's like yeah well i does all these different things and swallows a pickled fetus and they start talking about the ethical sourcing of the pickled fetus it's amazing okay you know it's that, that one right good, there dude. uh so i guess we should re we yeah we got to do this for a podcast audience who doesn't necessarily have eyes on screen. So I'll read it aloud. All right, I'm going to describe. I'm going to click it. All right. There we go. This is how Heidegger imagined Dasein in the mode of anticipatory resoluteness, a moment of vision that holds on without losing sight. And it shows this German shepherd. He talks about this dog right here on page 398 of Being in Time. So, it's a dog Dude. that's like in a hockey goalie uh, net. What is that called? The net in hockey? Uh, the goal. The, the goal, hockey yeah. goal. Yeah, and so the dog's like, and this guy's like using a hockey stick to throw all these different colored tennis balls at the dog or right past the dog and the dog is just standing there like super fierce like rigid not moving just like high alert and he just keep boop, 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 boop. but eventually he throws a couple of these pucks but they're the wrong color then he throws the black puck and that dog just gets it instantly and uh yeah man that's anticipatory resoluteness this is dog sign dog sign that shit that shit went hard How do we get off onto dog sign? Where are we? Um, because Ryan was <clears throat> upset that you're reading, dude. Yeah, the world's gonna burn because of it. Okay, this yeah. situation yeah. is brought about by man's exploitation of nature. But to see this solely as a relation of man and nature, that is, as a problem of technology or civilization, is deceptive. Such a view conceals the relations of exchange between people that lie behind the exchange relationship between people and nature. In fact, the first environmental crisis in world history was produced by Mesopotamian irrigation agriculture, which resulted in desertification. The same phenomenon was seen in the Indus and Yellow River civilizations. These were the earliest examples of institutions, states, that simultaneously exploited people and nature, the soil. In our industrial capitalist society, we now see this being carried out on a global scale. If we fail to grasp the problems of the exchange relations between people and the capital nation state form that these bring about, we will never be able to respond to these environmental problems. I want to point out also that one of the things that has me going, yeah, he gets it. Early on in talking about the sort of the existence of all A, B, C, you know, in one another. Like, part of the point of that is to say, bond exchange, 
existed in all other societies. Um, plunder and redistribution existed. Once he starts saying that, it's important to remember that um, there is a tendency um, with at least just like, we'll just call them um, like young anarchists or something that where it's like, or, you know, third worldists, uh, anarcho primitivists, um, this idea that there's like communalistic peoples and they live in peace. And then there's these other kinds of societies. And it's just like, no, I mean, sorry, it's just not true. I thought it like once upon a time, I just was like, oh, we're terrible. But if you go back in history, there were like people who weren't. And it's like, I think that there are obviously like nomadic peoples who have avoided violence and try to avoid the state and try to do their own thing. Um, that's fine. But what we're talking about is like societies. Societies always have their uh, obscene underside. And mm -hmm. it's just not effective or convincing to run with this. Oh, but we were like the good ones. Like, I don't know. Anne has this uh, book that she was looking at uh, called The Divine Goddess, something, something, this, that, the other. And it's like this African woman and she spells it with a K. And she's all talking about Africa with a K and how like her people were the originators of all philosophy and all art and all science, but they were peaceful and they had everything figured out. And it's just like, you know, it's like this, it's like cool, cool story, but like, sorry, like violence is like, uh, it's not just created by the state. Like the state is something that tries to uh, control for violence, right? Like, I don't know. It's that, that simplistic sort of D&G hippie approach. It's like, oh, yeah, if we could just get rid of the name of the father. If we could just remove law, if we could just, you know, just avoid the state, man, we'll uh, be able to live up to our desire and, you know, that'll overthrow capitalism, you know? We'll just have, we'll, we'll, yeah. fuck, we'll fuck capitalism out of existence by having crazy sex, you know? Yeah, and it is. I mean, it's it's a super complex issue, um, <clears throat> and which, which which what Nance means is that I'm I'm being so overly simplistic here, and he doesn't want to get in trouble in the future when the AI robots. No, I'm, I mean just like what we've said, <laughs> like it it it's people do kind of run toward those solutions. Oh yeah, if we just look to the past. We'll see that these people actually did it right. We'll see that these people actually did it right. And it and it it is the state and it is the white man. It is colonialism and it is expansion. It is this and it is that. Um, but no, it's not any of those. And also, yes, it's all of those. Um, and because it's everything, it's it's nothing. I don't know, like it's a thing that emerges. Um, and it emerges at scale. So if we have a global system of production and necessary universal exchange ability, then we will have these problems at that scale, this, this global scale. And when it's totally exploitive, when it exploits both the humans and nature, um, it like it, like it's a, it's a complex issue that's compounded by all these factors and this and that, um, and it like it really does emerge from the process itself, and it it's an ongoing thing that will have to be worked, uh, <clears throat> have to be managed. Like there's no one ultimate solution. So to say, oh, if we get rid of this state, we'll be fine, yeah. or oh, if we get rid of this subgroup or this outgroup, we'll be fine. Like, no, you, it, there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. It belongs right alongside us, right with love, right with food, right with every, like all the things it emerges um, out of the contradictions that like that we are in ourselves. Good shit. You want to read for a bit? I'll take some notes, but I'm also going to run to the restroom. Let's do it. The history of social formation. All right, hold on one second.
the history of social formations. I have said that I will rethink the history of social formations from the perspective of modes of exchange. The historical stages of development of social formations discussed in Marx's forms preceding capitalist formations, the Grundrisse, the primitive clan, Asiatic, ancient classical slave system, Germanic, and capitalist modes of production are my point of departure for this. With some additional qualifications, this classification system is still valid today. The first qualification is to remove Marx's geographical specifications. For example, what Marx calls the Asiatic social formation is not limited to Asia in any strict sense. It can also be found in Russia, the Americas, the Incas, Mayans, Aztecs, and so on, and Africa, Ghana, Mali, Dahomey. Similarly, the feudal mode is not limited to Germania. We see a similar phenomenon in Japan, after all. For these reasons, we must remove the geographical specifications in order to see social formations structurally. And this is when he's like, okay, the um actually guy, <clears throat> it's okay, you can do your thing, but also, you know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, something else. We're just using these examples as, illust as illustrative examples. We're, we're not doing an analysis of the multivaried differentialities within Japanese feudalism versus Germanic surf fiefdom blah, blah fuck off. Anyway, sorry. The second qualification is that we should not regard these formations as marking the successive stages of a linear historical development. That's another one too. Stages don't necessitate linear linearity originally or hierarchy i think that's a sticking point that a lot of people a lot of people want to reject the stage because it does imply a hierarchy um <clears throat> no originally marx's historical stages came about as a materialist rephrasing of hegel's the philosophy of history hegel regarded world history as the process of realization of universal freedom it started from africa passed through asia China, India, Egypt, Persia, then on to Greece and Rome, from there to Germanic society, and finally to modern Europe. It was a development from a stage in which no one was free to a stage in which only one person was free, then one in which a minority were free, and finally a stage in which all were free. Marx dismissed this as an idealistic approach and rethought world history from the perspective of modes of production. That is, of who owned the means of production. Are you grabbing that? Uh, sorry. What, what was the last sentence? <clears throat> uh, of who owned the means of production. Marx dismisses an idealist approach and rethought world history from the perspective of modes of production. That is, of who... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got it. All right. In this way, he arrived at an ordering that began... The primit with the primitive communism mode of production, followed by the Asiatic model of mode, excuse me, of production in which the king owns everything, the Greek and Roman slavery system, and then the Germanic feudal system. Table three presents the schema of Marx's historical stages as defined by mode of production. Now, do you want to do this table now or hold it till the end? I think we should do it right now. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm also getting good at switching over to the whiteboard and then switching back. So it shouldn't take more than a second. So focus box. Oh yeah, focus box. And while we're doing this, uh, so as far as I, I, I kind of want to keep those matrices up there. Maybe they don't have to be so yeah, big. I could make them. If, well, if you can erase what's on the bottom, we can fit this one on the bottom. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah. Actually, hold on, dude. I'm gonna take a quick screenshot. Just. Oh, it's already on the video. Never mind. <laughs> I forgot we're making the video. <laughs> 
You're gonna, you're gonna share this. You're gonna, I'm gonna take a screenshot. screenshot. Save it for later. <laughs> um, no, I get, I get that at a certain level. Uh, what's the point of the whiteboard? People can already just look at the. No, but it's it's about having it here, uh, it, between us, like and, it, and you and it's explaining a, it's a, it to me. Yeah, it's it's a tool for instruction. It's a tool for understanding. Yeah, um, I love in the, the process of getting this up on the board, we talk about it more and handle it more. Pick it up yeah. in our hands and observe it from different Sports. angles. Tactile. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. All right. Tactiles. So, table three. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's going to be six columns and two rows. One, two, three, four. Uh, I'm running out of room. Okay. Columns a little bit. I want them to be like this. All right. Should that work? That'll work. Yep, let's go. <clears throat> Top left, political superstructure. Is that the row or is that the... Uh, that's that not the, is... That's not the name of the row. No, 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 no. There's Okay. There are no labels it's on it. It's the name it. of the it's column. Just, yeah. Okay. Well, it's not even the name of the column. That is the first entry into the table. Oh, okay. So it says what? So, Political superstructure. Okay. So actually, the way the way the table is laid out now is perfect. You can just write above the line and below the line, and th that'll be the two rows. Yeah. Um, under political superstructure is economic base and mode of production in parentheses. Yeah. Next to political superstructure is stateless. And underneath that is clan society. That's my people, man. That's Next to stateless my, is... This is my Scottish blood, bro. <laughs> there we go. Next to stateless is Asiatic state. Asiatic state. Under that is king slash vassals. Um, how, how do you spell? Is it V A S S A L? Like S, that? yeah, V-A-S-S-A-L-S. -S -S -S. And in parentheses is agricultural community. Just write agcom, I guess. Okay. Next to Asiatic state is ancient classic state. And mm -hmm. under that is citizen slash slave. Next okay. to ancient classic okay. Okay. is... So... I just realized, no, there are names to these columns. The first, the first, well, sorry, there's names to these rows. The first column here is the names of the, the, the of, two rows. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you, see what I'm, do you see what I'm saying? So it's like. Yes. Yeah. So the economic yeah, they, base for the stateless society is the clan society. The economic base for the yeah. Asian society is the king slash fascial. Yeah. <clears throat> Citizen slave for ancient classic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, feudal state. And the base is feudal lord slash serfs. S E R F S. S E R F S. I said F's. And I know how to spell uh, modern. Modern. Uh, modern state. Modern state. Capital slash proletariat. K. 
Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And so, of course, so what that he's going to is... do is he's going to give this its own little rebranding. So I'll probably make room to write his rebranding in in different in a different color. And the uh, yeah, but the important thing here is that this is the, this is the the traditional Marxist stage theory. So meta modernists who are wondering why I keep saying that stage theory that doesn't think in reference to Marx and is just trying to deconstruct postmodernism or go beyond modern, postmodernism. Uh, this is this this is the stage theory that postmodernists are responding to. By trying to say it's not progressive, it's not linear, it's not geographically specific, it's not this, it's not that. There's complexity, there's nuance, and he's Kirtani's like, yeah, I can sublate all that, bring it right back in. Yeah. And yeah, perfect. That's that. So yeah, that that tracks. And he's going to spend the next few pages talking about it. Where was I? Table three presents the schema of Marx's historical stages as defined by mode of production. So what we're going to get into in this section is talking about modes of exchange and modes of production and political superstructure instead of just leaving out exchange. Kiratani's bringing that back in. According to Marx, the Asiatic agricultural community was the first formation to develop from clan society, and it constituted the economic base for the Asiatic state. But in fact, the Asiatic agrarian community was not something that developed as an extension of clan society. It was instead established by the Asiatic state. For example, large-scale irrigation agriculture was organized by the state and subsequently gave shape to the agrarian community. While it may appear as if it were something that developed out of clan society, this was not the case. We actually see stronger continuity with earlier clan societies in the cases of Greek and German societies. It is a mistake to see the Asiatic state as the primary stage of development. The Asiatic state, as it appeared in Sumer and Egypt, was characterized by bureaucratic structures and standing armies with a remarkably high degree of development, a level that would take states in other areas many years to reach, in some cases taking until the modern period. These centralized states took form through rivalries among multiple city-states. In Greece, on the other hand, the city-states remained independent and were never unified. This was not due to Greek civilization being more advanced. To the contrary, it was because the principles of reciprocity persisting since the period of clan societies retained a strong influence. This is one of the causal factors that led to the rise of democracy in Greece. <clears throat> These problems cannot be explained through modes of production. That perspective remains blind to, for example, the epochal significance of Greek and Rome in terms of historical stages. It is absurd to try to explain Greek democracy and the culture linked to it through the slavery system mode of production. The Greek slavery system was necessary only to secure the democracy of the city-state. That is, to preserve the freedom and equality of citizens. For this reason, the first question to ask here is how this freedom and equality developed. To answer this, we need to employ the perspective of modes of exchange. It is crucial to realize that the various social formations, clan, Asiatic, ancient classical, and Germanic, are not successive linear historical stages but instead exists simultaneously and in mutual interrelationship. Because each social formation exists in a world of mutual interrelationships, none can be considered in isolation. On this point, my thinking is in agreement with the world, with the world systems theory, 
uh, proposed by Emmanuel Waller Wallerstein and Christopher Chase Dunn, among others, which is actually a dope book that I got like partway through and I need to come back to. But yeah, Wallerstein, beast mode. Anyway, the latter distinguishes between very small systems, what Wallerstein calls mini systems, in which no state exists, world empires that are ruled by a single state and world economies in which multiple states engage in competition without being unified politically. When we view these distinctions in terms of modes of exchange, we obtain the following results. <clears throat> Many systems, in other words, world systems that exist prior to the rise of the state, are grounded in the principle of reciprocity. Next, in the case of world empires, we have a world system in which mode of exchange B is dominant, while in world economies, we have one in which mode of exchange C is dominant. What I want to emphasize here, though, is that these distinctions are not based on scale or size. A world system grounded in principles of reciprocity is generally small. Yet, if we look at the Iroquois Confederation of Tribes, we realize that it is possible for such a system to extend across a vast space. This also explains the secret of the vast empire built up by the nomad tribes of Mongol. Locally, each country in the empire was an instance of Asiatic despotism, but mutual relations in the community formed by the rulers of these countries were based on the reciprocity of a tribal confederation. By comparison, other world empires, including the Roman Empire, were local. <clears throat> Marx's Asiatic social formation is characterized by a system which one community gains ascendance over another and mandates compulsory service or tribute payment. In other words, it is a system in which mode of exchange B is dominant. Of course, there are various kinds of systems in which mode of exchange B is dominant, including feudal and slavery systems. They differ in whether the principle of reciprocity still remains intact within the ruling community. If it remains, it is difficult to establish a centralized order. Establishing a centralized order requires abolishing reciprocity among the ruling classes. Only then are central authority and the organization of a bureaucratic system possible. This does not mean, however, that the other modes of exchange do not exist within an Asiatic social formation. For example, accepting the tribute payments and compulsory service that are imposed on it, a local agrarian community under Asiatic despotism remains self-governing in internal matters and is grounded in an economy based on reciprocity, which is to say that mode of exchange A maintains a strong presence. Yet, such agricultural communities are largely created through irrigation projects or acts of conquest organized by the state, meaning they are dependents of the state monarchy. On the other hand, <clears throat> mode of exchange C also exists in Asiatic social formations. In them, we find both trade and cities. Their cities are frequently on a very large scale, but they are usually under the control of a centralized state. In this sense, in Asiatic social formations, modes of exchange A and C exist, yet mode of exchange B is dominant. Next, Marx argues that what he calls the ancient classical and Germanic social formations were grounded in slavery and serfdom systems, respectively. This means that these formations' primary principle lies in mode of exchange B. Accordingly, Samir Amin regards feudal systems as being a variation of the tribute system state. In this aspect, Greco-Roman and Germanic social formations were clearly similar to the Asiatic social formation, but they were quite different in other aspects. This becomes apparent when we look at the degree to which reciprocal mode of exchange A persisted within the ruling community. In Greece and Rome, centralized bureaucratic systems were rejected. For this reason, they never established centralized orders capable of unified rule over multiple communities and states. 
They became world empires only when they adopted the form of the Asiatic world empire, as happened under Alexander III, Alexander the Great. In Europe, world empire existed only nominally. The reality was continuous struggle among feudal lords. Because no powerful political center capable of controlling trade existed, marketplaces and cities tended to have autonomy. This explains why the so-called world economy developed there. Wallerstein maintains that the world economy appeared first in 16th century Europe. But world empire and world economy do not necessarily form stages in a linear historical development. As Fernand Bradell notes, world economy existed before this in, for example, ancient classical societies. In these, we find trade and markets not under state control. This is a decisive difference from the Asiatic world empire. Still, these world economies did, did not exist in isolation. While receiving the benefits of this world empire, they existed on the submargin, where they were buffered from military or political subjugation. <clears throat> Taking the example of Western Asia, when Mesopotamian and Egyptian societies developed into vast world empires, the tribal communities on their peripheries were either destroyed or absorbed. Yet, at the same time, the Greek cities and Rome were able to develop into city-states. These imported the civilization of Western Asia, namely its writing systems, weapons, and religions, among other things. But they did not adopt the model of a centralized political system and instead revived the direct democracy that had existed since the days of clan society. This option for dealing with the center was possible, however, only because they were situated at a certain distance from it. Karl Witt Vogel called this sort of a region a submargin. If regions were too close to the core, as in the case of the margin, they would have been dominated by or absorbed into the despotic state. If they were too far away, on the other hand, they would likely remain untouched by either state or civilization. If we say that Greece and Rome were established on the submargin of the Oriental empires, then we can also say that feudalism, the feudal social formation, was established in Germanic tribal societies, which were on the submargin of the Roman Empire. More precisely, they were situated on the submargin of the Islamic Empire, which reestablished the West Asian world empire in the wake of the fall of the Roman Empire. Europe's inheritance of Greek and Roman culture took place through the Islamic world. In that sense, the Hegelian notion of a linear development from Greece and Rome to Germany is nothing more than a Eurocentric fiction. What more, <clears throat> what more than anything distinguishes feudalism from a despotic tribute-based state? is the persistence or lack of the principle of reciprocity within the ruling class community. A feudal order is established through a bilateral reciprocal agreement between the Lord and his retainers. The Lord grants feudal domains to his retainers, or he provides them with direct support. In return, the vassals offer loyalty and military service to the Lord. Because this agreement is bilateral, if the Lord fails to fulfill his obligations, retainers may abrogate their allegiance to him. This is not something that developed from Greece or Rome. It arose instead from the principle of reciprocity, reciprocity that had persisted since clan society. <clears throat> principle that had vanished in Greece and Rome and that did not permit the king or chief to assume an absolute position. The Germanic peoples inherited the civilizations of the Roman and Islamic empires, but rejected the bureaucratic hierarchies of the despotic state. As I have already noted, this is a stance possible only on the submargin of a world empire. It is, moreover, not something limited to Western Europe, Germania. In the Far East, Japan too had a feudal system. The Japanese actively imported China's civilization in all areas, but they implemented only the surface trappings of the Asiatic despotic state 
and its attendant ideologies. And here we come upon another table. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, this is a table that can be uh, adapted into the previous one, right? Isn't it? Social um, formation, dominant mode of exchange, world system, clan, Asiatic, yeah, but ancient classical feudal <laughs> capitalism. I think it's like a, a fusion of, so the previous table was just kind of outlining the stages. And this includes the stages, but it also includes the modes of exchange from the earlier graph, uh, the earlier tables. And over here, He's injecting this world system from world systems theory, where he's basically there's three categories, mini system, world empire, and world economy. Um, what are the ones without <clears throat> what are the ones without a uh, world system? Why don't they have world system? They are also oh, they are on the sub margins of world empire. Oh, so okay. they're like they would be in this system they would be categorized under world empire but it would be the the asiatic world empire is the example the ancient classical and the feudal are two systems that are contingent on the world empire but are not don't belong to the world empire gotcha so let's put uh so over here under clan in orange, I'm just going to put recipro reciprocity. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to do the A. <laughs> there we go. A. Yep. A. Boom. And you have a third color? Uh, orange or blue? I got blue. Orange. Uh, or yeah, let's Red do is, blue. Mini, Red's all mini system. Okay. Mini system got it okay um under asiatic that would be type b mode yep. uh, mode of exchange b and it's actually b1 because he he has multiple b's but b1 and that is world empire Ancient classical is B2. And that again, it's sub marginal and contingent on the world empire. So, yeah, I would just write sub marginal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, feudal is B3. And same thing, contingent, submargins. Okay. And capitalism is C, our favorite commodity exchange, and that is world economy. Ooh. Globalism. Oh, the globalist. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, um, that was really good, actually. And yeah, dude, the the Wallerstein. I think there were three books that outlined world systems theory. Um, super, super interesting, dude. I got into. I think it was the second book because it it's broken up into like historical eras. Um. And I think I started reading the one about like the 1800s or I, I don't fucking know. But so that this world system is um, a different take on stages, I guess, that is trying to account for the mode of exchange. So the clan. That is a mode of exchange based in reciprocity is a mini system. And again, this is nothing prescriptive here. These are all just different different stabs at trying to describe what is going on so the mini system is something 
that it isn't necessarily size or scale, but mm. it's helpful to think in those terms um, because a, a clan would tend to be smaller. Um, but it's just that social arrangement, the political and economic arrangement that's dominated by reciprocity. The Asiatic, which is dominated by plunder and redistribution, um, will lead to this, the world empire where many systems can kind of exist within the world empire, but ultimately they would be like vassals to uh, the feudal lord or whatever. Like you can have a clan that is self-contained, dominated by reciprocity, but there's going to be the overlord or whatever who is going as, to dominate through plunder and redistribution. As there was in the relation to, you know, Britain. It, exactly. Yeah. With with the actual then, Scottish people. Yeah. Yep. Their clans. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like the, the Scottish clans were doing the reciprocity thing and they were hanging out throwing trees and wearing skirts. And then the British, the British empire was like, Hey motherfucker, give us your shit. <laughs> give it. They were like, give well, it to us. we'll give you some shit, but you can't kill all of us. And Britain was like, okay, we won't kill all of you. And so the Britain had the world empire, but the clans, the Scottish clans maintain this mini system kind of underneath. Um, ancient classical B2 still plunder um, and redistribution but it's on the sub margins of the world empire which means that it was made possible due to the world empire but because it was far enough away or problematic enough or whatever to be subsumed or conquested or whatever by the world empire um, so it maintained its own version of independence and what's but because, the world empire here what's the world empire here that we're talking greece and rome are both part um, of they're both they sub were marginal to world empire yeah so they kind of developed out of it and they also they had their own empires too just like britain had its own empire too right but it's not but it wasn't like um oh, that's right so that's confusing to me. It's confusing to yeah, be yeah. like, because when I, I think of empires myself. at that time, I just think, you know, Alexander the Great was, was, uh, you know, he's, he's like this later Caesar in the sort of sense that like they were these emperors, like they really founded empires, yeah. uh, which was to say like all other lands were like under their dominion, but he's saying yeah, but that was only possible as part of like their relation to what the global yeah. empire, like what or or what? I did I blank out on that part? Well, what are we talking about? Like we're talking about China? No. What's the what's the I, empire they're submarginal to? Yeah, that's the thing. I got confused. So he we he was talking about like modern European feudal society as submarginal to ancient classical society and ancient classical society was submarginal to Asi Asiatic empires. But again, it's not necessarily geographical. It's just like a, a description of what's going on. So this stage, if you will, the Asiatic stage of world empire. Yeah. Creates the position or the creates the, possibility of the ancient classical empire which is still an empire but it's it's like a modification that has to do with so he said that okay i remember this part it's that the the it's this idea of the absolute the absolute sovereign yes the absolute sovereign was not a greek or roman idea but it was taken yep. over from the Asiatic model. Yes. Yeah. And that modifies the reciprocity of the ruler and the ruled. Yep. 
So, well, so it's a modification because, of because that exchange. Because those reciprocal relations are being uh, trumped out or like uh, like uh, the, the absolute despot says, sorry, you don't get to have all these sort of organic and uh, gift like exchange uh, ties between all of yourselves. Yep. Sorry, no, all of that comes to me now, motherfuckers. And then I'll tell you yep. what you get. I'll tell you what you get. Yeah. It's by my grace. And then there's and then there's also in the European model another modification on that. So there's this like absolute, no, it's all mine, give it to me. Another modification would be not only can the Lord withdraw his protection or his whatever support of the vassals. But the vessels themselves can withdraw their support of the Lord. Um, if the Lord fails to back them up in the battle or whatever, they can change sides. They can do the Robert Baratheon. Um, that is something developed in this feudal version of World Empire, which the modification happened due to the fact that they were submarginal which would be a geographical thing for the most part. I guess it also could be solely economic, but so the world empire is separated into these three modes, Asiatic, ancient classical and feudal. So the Asiatic has this absolute, the ancient classical would have some parity between the vassals um, uh, across the board. And then the feudal, has functionally a parity between the vassal state as an like as a totality and the ruler as a totality so like uh so the scottish people could rebel against the british emperor because there there was some reciprocity going on there but it's still world empire because it's still dominated by this plunder and redistribution Yep. So the modification of world empire in the ancient classic state is a modific. I don't. Uh, is it? it the the is idea it, is of it, is it the idea of like a of more of a a, a sort of a more like democ democratic sort of reciprocal yeah, ideal like, that's founded in the slavery a, a, uh in this one yes a, and then a parody among the participants that is like contingent upon that slavery that that productive base um but they wouldn't have had that great idea to be a community of free men on the basis of slaves without the slaves if it, if it wasn't no 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 if it wasn't for this other this world empire thing that had already given this idea of this absolute freedom the idea was yes the citizen, yes 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 the, the idea of the citizen there, here is the idea of a person who wants to be a free man like that king was yes right that, that's an idea that so it's like when people are like oh well can't we all just be citizens it's like they're forgetting that like the idea of that kind of freedom is premised on wanting to be on little the unfreedom kings. Which was already yeah, on our freedom, yeah. Um, Which is also, well, I mean, in my own book, I get into the whole, you know, the we talk about freedom, but we don't like to think about like the condition of freedom is someone else's right. slavery, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's that kind of that parody where the aspiring members of these ancient classical empires can work towards being, you know, petty monarchs. And then the feudal is um, the, the ability for the, the vassals to detach from the empire itself and, and seek out their own freedom. Yeah, which wasn't really an idea in the ancient classic state. You mm -hmm. could not, you could not. So the idea was that you could not be free of the community of free men in the ancient classic state without taking your own life. That was the only way to do it with honor, which is why Socrates 
took his own life. Um, which is why, uh, uh, who's the, who's the, uh, not, not Epictetus, not Aurelius, who's the other, uh, big time stoic? Seneca. I think he's the one who, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he had to cut himself. His Nero was going to have him killed. And so back then they would send runners ahead and say, hey, Was that you know, Tertullian? No, it wasn't Tertullian. Why am I thinking Tertullian? Who's the other guy? Anyway, no, I think it is Seneca. Yeah, I think it was Seneca had to kill himself. Yeah. And the, his, runners showed up and were like, okay, you know, it's been decided you're going to die. And then he's like, oh, okay, I better kill myself. Right? Because he wants to maintain his honor. Well, what we're saying is that under this society, this feudal state society, this modification of B, uh, you can actually leave and have your honor. Like if 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 you already have that honor. So as a as a noble or as a as right. a uh right. The serf can't leave. As a serfs can't leave, but the uh, the regional dukes or wards or whatever they are they can withdraw their loyalty to the over king or the overlord or whatever i dude there's going to be someone who's like i'm actually and yeah i i don't know the words <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be an ortho oh, bro good. for sure we'll come in here and set us <laughs> straight <laughs> and, and then uh capitalism commodity exchange world economy that uh that is this idea of parity across the board you know uh we can all face the freedom that uh didn't exist until this asiatic absolute sovereign that then went through these historical stages before that back here in the clan it wasn't even a question it was just like yeah we do what we do this is what we're, you know, we're a troop of monkeys um, living out here in the woods, shitting in bushes, eating berries. It, freedom wasn't a concept. Because it was never imperiled. Could you, what page are we on? Is it uh, 25? Uh, 25. Okay. Yeah, just going to make a quick little note then uh, to summarize where we're at. Uh, so... Um, I'm going to have to actually type out this whole copy paste. I don't have the, you do. Can you, can you bring it over? I'm going to, I'm going to add. Some oh, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I, you're the one with the, the, the OCR here. All right. And so. Oh, that needs to be formatted though, but yeah, format that shit. Do you know how to make a table in Google um docs? It's not too hard. Yeah, it's, actually... it's not too really hard, but I'm slow and let me make it. Don't don't even worry about it. So you click on insert, you go to table, and you just click okay. So we want three uh columns and three columns. How many rows? Six rows. Boom. Done. Perfect. You paste all that shit in. I'm going to sit here and write some prose. Uh, I'm going to pause the actual recording. All right, we're back. Let's go. Oh, in and I guess systems. I should say, I'm going, to, yep. I'm going to go ahead and read the paragraph that I wrote because I think that we're actually saying oh, something yeah. in a way that's a little different than him, which is kind of why I'm just going to go ahead and put the whole thing in brackets because it's like my summary, but I think it is what he's getting at. But he doesn't quite put it this way. So I said a progression of freedom goes from only the absolute despot in the Asiatic world having freedom to a limited freedom between equals on the basis of slavery in the ancient classical state. This idea of freedom then gets expanded to the feudal lords, but now they are able to withdraw support for the king. The absolute freedom of the Asiatic despot was founded upon the abolition of these reciprocal ties between the smaller lords, but it comes back. It's the return of the repressed that keeps coming back, motherfucker. And then finally, capitalism formalizes this ability to leave for everyone. So everyone gets to leave. 
meaning you can take your fucking labor power and go trade for your bread crumbs and dirt bikes. So, uh, it's like, that is part of what he's tracing out here. He's also showing you how, uh, three of these stages are, uh, based on the plunder and redistribution model, which is yeah. B. Yeah. Yeah. That whole thing. He's, but, he's adding depth to the, to stages, um, <clears throat> which I don't think is ever a bad idea. Yeah. Um, and, and it, I think he's always careful to kind of like re reiterate that again, this is not a historical necess necessary linear process, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he's just kind of fleshing out the interrelationship between political superstructure and economic base as seen as not just production, but also exchange. Sick. All right. Um, so, and also obviously calling back to Hegel with the uh, his, historical progression of freedom. So I'll finish this final paragraph and then move on to the final section. In feudal systems that refused the establishment of a centralized state, trade in cities were able to develop outside of state control. In concrete terms, Western European cities took advantage of ongoing struggles between the Pope and kings and between feudal lords to establish their own independence. In agricultural communities, too, we see the transformation of land into private property and the rise of commodity production. In this sense, the feudal order led to the rise of a world economy system that was not unified politically. <laughs> Herein lies the reason for why the capitalist world system arose from Europe. This schema can be seen in Table 4, which we just spent the last few minutes discussing. Amazing. All right. My turn. And uh, we're on the home stretch here, folks. So that was pretty much our goal was to get through the introduction here because I think that this is sufficient for giving us a strong sense of what goes on in this book. He does a lot more in this book, but it does give us the roadmap and some of its details. Man, that chair, I raise it up and then it sinks down slowly and then sometimes i raise it back up and it sinks down really fast it's just i need a real chair one of these days the modern world system finally the capitalist social formation is a society in which mode of exchange c commodity exchange is dominant we must approach this not from within a single social formation but rather through the interrelationship of social formations that is as part of a world system seen from the perspective of world's, world systems. Once the world economy that developed from 16th century Europe began to cover the entire world, the previously existing structure of world empires, along with their margins and submargins, became untenable. As Wallerstein notes, what took its place was the world economy structure consisting of core, semi-periphery, and periphery. In this, the previous world empires found themselves situated in the periphery. Just as it is impossible to understand the economy of a single nation without reference to the world system, so too is it impossible to understand any single state in isolation without reference to the world system. The modern state is a sovereign nation. This is not something that appeared within the boundaries of a single isolated nation. In Western Europe, a sovereign nation was established under the interstate system of mutually recognized sovereignty. What forces this to happen was the world economy, expanding European domination, then forced a similar transformation on the rest of the world. Among the previous world empires, those such as the Incas or Aztecs that consisted of loose tribal confederations underwent dissolution into tribal societies and colonization. Moreover, many tribal societies that existed in the margins of these former world empires 
were also colonized by the European powers. But the world, but the old world empires were not easily colonized. In the end, they were divvied, they were divided up into multiple nation states, as was the case with the Ottoman Empire. Those such as Russia or China that escaped this fate established a new world system through socialist revolution and thereby seceded from the world economy. Next, let us examine this transformation from within a single social formation. The rise to dominance of mode exchange C did not mean the extinction of the other modes of exchange, but rather, while it may appear that the previously dominant plunder redistribution mode of exchange B has disappeared, in fact, it has merely changed form. Mode B has become the modern state. In Western Europe, this was the first man. This, yeah, hold on. I feel like that's really important. For example, while it may appear that the previously dominant plunder redistribution mode of exchange has disappeared, it is. It, it is the. It has merely changed form. Mode B has become the modern state. In Western Europe, this was first manifested in the form of the absolute monarch. The monarch allied with the bourgeoisie to bring about the fall of the other feudal lords. The absolute monarchy brought about the state equipped with a standing army and bureaucratic structure. In a sense, this was the delayed realization of something that had long existed in the Asiatic empires. Under the absolute monarchy, feudal land rent transformed into land taxes. The aristocracy, feudal lords, who had lost their feudal privileges at the hands of the absolute monarch, became state bureaucrats who received the redistribution of these land taxes. At the same time, the absolute monarchy, by engaging in the redistribution of taxes, took on the garb of a kind of welfare state. In this way, the plunder redistribution mode of exchange lives on at the core of the modern state. Really quick here, I have to click and drag and drop something that I forgot to do earlier. I'm going to have something uploading in the background so that it's ready to go. All right, there we go. The, abs the absolute monarch was overthrown by the bourgeois revolution, but the bourgeois revolution actually strengthened the centralization of power by toppling the intermediate powers. Montesquieu, he cites Montesquieu as having said this. Those intermediate powers that were capable of resistance under the absolutist order, such as the nobility and the church. In this way, a society emerged in which the principle of commodity exchange was universally affirmed. Yet this does not mean that the previously existing modes of exchange were abolished. The plunder redistribution mode persisted. Now, however, it took on the form of state taxation and redistribution. Moreover, the people, having replaced the king in the position of sovereign, were subordinated to the politicians and bureaucratic structures that were supposed to be their rep representatives. In this sense, the modern state is virtually unchanged from earlier states. In the previously existing states, whether Asiatic or feudal, mode of exchange B was dominant, but the modern state takes on the guise of the new dominant mode of exchange C. What is the fate of reciprocal mode of exchange A in the capitalist social formation? Under it, the penetration of the commodity economy dismantles the agricultural community and the religious community that corresponded to it. But these return in a new form, the nation. The nation is an imagined community, Benedict Anderson, based on reciprocal relations. It brings about an imaginary form of communality that transcends the class conflict and contradictions caused by the capitalist system. In this way, the capitalist social formation is a union, or Bohemian knot, of three forms, capital, nation, state. So far, we have revised the social, the social formations that Marx described in terms of modes of exchange. 
but this alone is insufficient. We must also take up one more instance, mode of exchange D. Previously, I said that this would be the return of mode exchange A in a higher dimension, and that it would take the form of an X that transcends capital nation state. See tables one and two. Just, just jogging my memory here, in the preface, didn't he say that it's like the prior to A like is also going to be sublated? Is it the pooling um, gets sublated in D? Or is it just A, the gift counter gift? Um, <clears throat> I don't think he specifically said... Either way, I think he just pointed out that that pooling is prior to exchange itself. I don't know if he says it huh. it comes right along with reciprocity or not. Huh. Um, okay. I don't but know. This argument, this argument took up mode D only within the terms of a single social formation. Social formations always exist in relation to other social formations. In other words, they exist within world systems. Accordingly, mode of exchange D should be thought of at the level of a world system that includes multiple interrelated social formations. More precisely, it cannot be thought of in terms of a single isolated social formation. The sublation of capital nation state can be realized only in the form of a new world system. You know, I can't help but wonder where his disagreement is going to fundamentally lie when it comes to Dugan. It seems to me it would probably just be um, the nature of the new world system, right? Like, uh, instead of like, a, oh, we'll have all of these old empires kind of play within their lanes, stay out of each other's backyards, you know, oh, stick to your continent kind of thing. I'm imagining that for Caratani, there's going to be a lot more of a no, but like, we're not going to waste all of this labor power on creating our own widgets in every city, in every one of these, we, we actually still have to have some kind of a world market. It just, uh, it shouldn't be one that's on the, it shouldn't be commodity exchange. You know, it should be on the basis of something else. And then hopefully we could get yeah. Gores in there. Hopefully we could, oop, there, there's where Gores comes in. That's where we, uh, I don't know. I've never seen Caratani get into that yet. Right, the idea of like taking heteronymous labor just over here where it's like, oh, that's necessary for sure. Widgets and the like essential essential ones as opposed to bobbleheads or whatever. So as to free up autonomous and cooperative labor. I haven't seen him go there, you know. So yeah. <clears throat> Kiritani could be as is it's like he gets it on so many levels, but I've never I've never I've never gotten that kind of Gorsian concern for the politics of time itself from Caratani yet. Uh, but he, I, I, but that's what I'm saying is how, whatever he thinks of as this world system, it's probably going to be a bit more communistic than whatever Dugan's got in mind for a multipolar yeah. world. Right. Yeah. 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 Like Dugan wants everyone to be able to be Eastern Orthodox or, some some form of orthodox you know islam or some kind of or you know and then and then you'll have over here in america like a, a liberal democracy but it'll have to stop being an empire that messes around in the middle east blah 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 so yeah i think this at a superficial look oh yeah these two could go together dugan and and, and karatani i think What's more important is that Karatani can answer all the problems posed by Dugan, uh, yep. but also he's a bit more forward-looking when it comes to using technology and sublating mm -hmm. all the different forms of these things. Because I don't think 
uh, there's anything important in liberalism that Dugan really wants to sublate. Like I don't, I, I, he acts like he does, but I don't, I don't believe it. To recapitulate, world mini systems came into being through mode of exchange A. World empires through mode of exchange B, and world economy, the modern world system, through mode of exchange C. If we understand this, we can also understand how a world system X that supersedes these would be possible. It will come into being as the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension. In concrete terms, world system X will come into being not through the power of military force or money, but through the power of the gift. In my view, what Immanuel Kant called a world republic was the ideal of this sort of world system. Table 5 diagrams this. So I think that would also mean then that, you know, the gifts you are given by this social order would make you want to give back or f you'd feel kind of like shitty and then you wouldn't want to be expelled the power of exclusion would actually be like no you know you want to be a part of it you know that's that's what that would imply i think yeah like <clears throat> <laughs> what are you thinking no i just the like the idea of the gift as the foundation um i think it it it's really intuitive people really like the idea of sacrifice um to re not even reinforce but to to articulate and support and express and and like to be their belonging like that's very intuitive for i think probably most people it's like if if you i like take it back to chores like if you if you live in a in a function in a well-functioning family uh try not to exclude anybody here but if like if you if you live in a house with other people um there's going to be chores that you all have to do and if you want that house to be high functioning and if you want people to be able to actualize themselves and all these things there will be chores that are maybe explicitly assigned maybe implicitly assigned but there's chores that everyone is assigned to <clears throat> and it is through the completion of these chores that you the you know that the household or whatever is freed up to their self-actualization or whatever and it's because of all this, you are making a sacrifice. You belong. It feels good. It's intuitive. I like it a lot. I think there's obviously a lot of people take that and and you know make a right turn and do this uh, like like the movie Starship Troopers or the book Starship Troopers. But I think the movie is better at illustrating the like. Do you want to be a citizen? You have to like join the military and you have to serve in the military. And once you've done all that, then you are a citizen. And until you've mm -hmm. done all that, you're not a citizen. You're just a person who lives here. Um, I don't know. It's a powerful idea. I think it's mostly true. Like, I think it is through these sacrifices that we distinguish to ourselves and to others our belonging. Um, and of course, you know, that that can open up the door to some fucky shit and that can be taken advantage of and it can be gross, but also it can be good too. like earlier we were talking about food and how Anne is called to the, the preparing and the consumption of food. Um, that could be articulated in terms of sacrifice. And it could also be articulated in, in, in terms of gift. Like she's giving a gift of her time and the food that she's preparing. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, thing, I like it a lot. I think. But she also doesn't want to be stuck with that role all the time. She also wants to be able to take a break. For, right. 
right that's the, not to essentialize and, and do all these know, things yeah that... my my concern with this formulation though is that the the power of the gift is through on the one side exclusion um and on the other it was uh like this sense of obligation where, but also just like you could humiliate somebody by giving them gifts. And he does get into this more in one of the future chapters, uh, which would yeah. be, so you have, I don't, you're, you're a cuck. I gave you better shit and you didn't give me good shit I back. Gave you, so you're the cuck. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, I think that we have this idea that there's also in the household a not, so I think he even said this kind of though, that the symbolic, that, no, that the, uh, the gift exchange, counter gift, gift counter gift relation is one that's between communities, but within the community you have pooling. And so it's Ooh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting how, like, in our households, that all of these modes exist to some degree. Like, you, you just pool things, but then there's also like this gift counter gift kind of element to things. But then there's actually like a straight up commodity le level to things sometimes where it's like, like, I want that. No, it's mine. Are you, can I have it? No. Can I buy it from you? You know, like, does that happen very often? No, I can't even think of an example of that happening in my own, like, recent life. But, um, but these all ostensibly exist in any, uh, family. But the thing is, is the pooling does exist in the family. And so the question is, is like, uh, I think the reason that he is saying it would be A as opposed to pooling. We can't act like we're one big happy family and that we yes. don't owe each, we, we can't act like, you know, oh yeah. Now it's interesting because like obligation still underlies the family relation or just the inside the community. People have the sense of an infinite debt and the, the, the gift counter gift plays off of that sense of the infinite debt because uh, and this is something Graeber gets into. It's also something Levinas gets into. And you cannot ever pay it back. Like if I were to take all of a patron's money the patron's ever given me and give them exactly that amount back, like that would, it would be like, what? It's, it's actually an insult. It's like, no, the, the point was that you're supposed to use it. This point was you're supposed to do something with it. And what you give back is supposed to be something different and disproportionate. It's not supposed to be squared you know, monetarily. And so, uh, I, I, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that in this, uh, A, B, C, D formula, reciprocity with the gift counter gift is only one of the two kinds of reciprocity. The pooling kind of reciprocity escapes the logic of the counter gift. When it's in yeah. the, when it's just like a strict family, strict, small community, strict band of like, we're all equals here. Right. So. Yeah. So I think, I think the realist position is. Um, is the gift. Obviously it would, it, it would be nice to have the pooling and we can chase it and we can aim at it. And it, it will persist within our small, sm the smallest in groups that we have. And we can even use it as a guiding principle for society writ large. But to, to, to be a realist about it, there, <clears throat> there is going to be a, differenti a, a differential of power. And there will be something that enforces that. And like as, as much as like, I mean, it, it always comes back to that. Like you have to take a realist position um and there will people who need to be kept in line and and like yeah if you fuck up we're gonna shit on you and we're gonna expel you from the community maybe that's not ever explicitly stated anywhere but it is always implicit and i think that's <clears throat> um just as powerful maybe not just as powerful but i think it's very powerful as as these other forms of power but it's also better it is better. No, I don't want to chop your head off. No, I don't want to like 
socially humiliate you and also make sure you're homeless and poor and destitute and all these things like um it's like yeah if you're a dick we're gonna call you a dick and everyone's gonna know you're a dick but that's it we're not gonna use physical force on you we're not gonna like go out of our way and fuck up our whole shit to just fuck with you because you're a dick and that social death is a very compelling thing um, and if we weren't already in this situation where we're all like struggling to to steal back what little time energy we can from the system, like if if we all did live in what I'll go ahead and call utopian conditions, which I'm not using that in a bad way. I want I am a utopian. Like I do yeah. want yeah, I yeah, do yeah. want to ask for the moon, right? Um like if if we were all living in this utopia, um, then I think we would be less concerned with cancel trying to fuck each other over. And yeah, like it'd be like, yeah, okay, whatever, dude, you're a dick. I'm over here. I got my shit. I'm good. I have food. I have shelter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have the means to pursue, you know, that which I choose to pursue. And and it's not like we're all just a bunch of like starving angry uh animals like we're we're actually like complete human beings i think um, I, I think to like the this because I, I i just brought up in cancel culture uh, in line with that and so for me it's just like mm -hmm. the the fear is that we're moving into a neo-feudal society where uh it's like you have to work you have to pay for all these different things or you're screwed um and then because you have to have a profile you have to have a clean profile you have to have a clean profile and because there's increasing competition for any decent career or occupation uh you really that it can't just be a clean profile it also has to stay the thing and so whether that thing is free palestine or you know i stand with israel it depends on the year it depends on the decade uh, it depends on a lot of things, but like, you know, in five years, in 10 years, what you have in, in terms of that profilicity may or may not help you out. You really have no way of knowing because of the rotating chairs on the Titanic. And so, but the, why are they rotating and why is it so fast? It's because of the hyper com competition within the PMC, which is where we got into it with Benjamin Studebaker on why the Aaron Reichs are wrong in their third essay. This idea that, oh, but neoliberalism is going to make it so the PMC wall wants to work together with the working class. It's like, no, nah, man, like they're just going to keep ratcheting up the, <clears throat> uh, the, the goalposts, you know, whatever. So I guess when I think about that is like, what's immediate, what we're actually dealing with, what we're moving into. We're already in it. It's probably just going to get worse for a while. Um, and then I think about like some kind of a world beyond what we're in and you put X over it. And it's like, are we just talking about like a really fucking terrifying cathedral? Whether it's yeah. rainbow or Eastern Orthodox, like it's going to be, you know what I mean? Or are we, or is there a possibility for something else there? You know, I, I like that he leaves it an open question, but uh, for us to be thinking through this, just not just you and me, but like all of us, um, you know, all three of these forms of power are in our lives every day. Um, existing forces and institutions utilize them. Also, little experiments like this one uh, uses them or is reliant on them, and so. The question is like, what's going to become dominant? And then is there a way that one of these things in its dominant form can be less bad than the others? And are there different contents that can change the form or vice versa in a way that would make one preferable over another? Ultimately, it probably doesn't matter. We probably don't have any choice over it. We probably are just, you know, in the bleachers here watching world history move on by having our little dance party. But it's good to think about. You know, I think it's good to think yeah. about. It's good to stay up at night, all night, 
almost every night thinking about because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we right. really have no other choice right exactly. no i i i i do think that's it i do think that's the tension is it uh is it that neo neo feudal hellscape um or is it something that allows us a little more freedom and a little more agency uh, a little more control a little more self-determination um and if nobody does anything we are like you said we're already in this phase transition we're already there um the label matters less than the actuality of what's happened production has changed exchange has changed um just modes of of being a citizen have changed all these things have changed and people um seem resistant to to really dealing with it but we're already there and it, and it will continue to get worse and it will definitely get worse for the short term uh the question is long term is there anything we could do about it That's the question. In the following chapters, I will explore these fundamental modes of exchange. I will try to clarify how the social formations that take shape as combinations of these in the world systems ended up taking the form of capital nation state and how it might be possible to supersede this. First, however, I would like to note several things. I treat these four primary modes of exchange as separate entities. In reality, they are interrelated. And cannot be taken up in isolation from one another. Nonetheless, in order to see their relationships, we must first clarify the phase in which each exists. I have already argued in capital, Marx bracketed off the other modes of exchange in order to explain the system formed by commodity exchange. I will carry out a similar procedure with regard to the state and nation. This will provide the basis for seeing how state, capital, and nation are related to one another. How, in other words, these fundamental modes of exchange are related historically. In order to do this, I will distinguish four separate stages. World mini systems that have existed since before the rise of the state, the world empires that arose before capitalism, the world economy that has emerged since the rise of capitalism, and finally, the present and future. Finally, to avoid any misunderstandings, um, well, should we look at that table really quick? I've read past it. Um, is it is it what he just said, uh, or is it something else? Uh, real systems. Yeah. No, it's it, and so many world system, which going back to our plans. Uh, world empire going back to ancient classical Asiatic and feudal and the world economy uh, the modern world system now the world republic where's that coming from? <laughs> he hasn't said anything about that is that a slip <laughs> is that what he has in mind for D <laughs> that's what I thought at first but It's in the place of D. I don't think if we so. if we do this clockwork thing that he does. I think so. This is Wallerstein's language. I don't think he's saying this is D. I think he's just saying this is how Wallerstein lays it out. Okay. Um. Uh, do you, you scroll up to the previous page? I just want to yeah. see. Did he say anything about is did the word republic even appear in this? Oh, book so okay. Far? In my view, what Immanuel Kant called a world republic was the ideal of this sort of world system. So he is saying world republic. Okay. Okay, let's, so let's sure. reread those last few Kant. sentences. Did I actually read that earlier or did we skip it somehow? I'm gonna Yeah, but let's the, read it again. It's if in, we in concrete terms. No, it's higher up. I want to get the whole progression. Whole okay. The whole paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to read it? To recapitulate. World mini systems came into being through mode of exchange A, world empires through mode of exchange B, and world economy, the modern world system, through mode of exchange C. If we understand this, we can also understand how a world system X that supersedes the
it will come into being as the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension. In concrete terms, World System X will come into being not through the power of military force or money, but through the power of the gift. In my view, what Immanuel Kant called a world republic was the ideal of this sort of world system. Table 5 diagrams this. So yeah, that table is just a transposition on the earlier uh, organizations and modes of exchange. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put... Many, many systems are nations. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um... So wait, so, so we're going to system is a, we'll just put nations in here. Yes. Or it's, I mean, it's right next to. Interesting. Um, world empire is B state. World economy is D, or excuse me, C, capital. So to reiterate, B, plunder and redistribution, state, world empire. A, gift, counter gift. Reciprocity, nation, many world system. C, commodity exchange, capital, world economy. And D, the mysterious thing X, which we've been talking all about, is uh, here described as Kant's world republic. Or maybe here, you know, Articulated in Kant's World Republic. He'll get into this bit on Kant and uh, the contradictions of Kant's position, but and he'll do this whole thing with it. It's really cool. All right. Um, cool. All right, good. That's excellent. Now let's read the last paragraph. We'll have our closing thoughts and call it a day. Call it a good day. Finally, to avoid any misunderstandings, let me make one last observation. I am not trying to write here, the sort of world history that is ordinarily taken up by historians. What I am aiming at is a transcendental critique of the relationships between the various basic modes of exchange. This means to explicate structurally three giant shifts that have occurred in world history. To do this is to set us on the trail to a fourth great shift, the shift to a world republic. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your likes, for your comments, for your subscribes, for your patronage. Uh, special shout out to uh, Darian Large and Nikki Lodge, Nico Lodge, my uh, my top patrons. Thank you so much for all of you. Uh, thank you to the students at Theory Underground. Uh, thank you, everybody, for making this possible. We love to be here. We love to do it. It's a lot of fun, and. Uh, yeah, we'll say some closing thoughts here. But I'm not being ironic. You should actually like it. You should go click the like button. I know. Yeah. It's silly. But... Click the button, do the thing. No, but teach the algorithm to give you better content. That's your job. There we go. There we go. That is the thing. It is an uphill battle, everyone. Uh, dear reader, 
uh, we're all engaged in this struggle. Um, whether or not you're here on the live side, whether or not you're watching this, when it comes out this weekend, whether or not you're watching this six months from now, we are all engaged um, <clears throat> in the struggle against this like very instrumentalized production and distribution of worldview affirming content. We are trying mm -hmm. to break out of whatever the fuck it is that's got us all trapped. Um, and you're a part of it too. And like, seriously, thank you for, um, for riding this train with us. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I love doing it. This fucking book is dope. Uh, Mosley was a slog. We'll get back to it. Um, I'm actually excited yeah. to get back to it with fresh eyes. Give it a yep. little, Same. give it a little time to sink in. Um, be a little bit more, more charitable. Um, a little bit more engaged. I, I was definitely probably turned off a little bit because it, it's just, it's not great reading. Uh, but that, I mean, maybe that was a mood thing too. Maybe coming back to it, it'll be like, Oh, this is actually really good. I don't know. Chapter uh, chapter three of that book got better than the first two chapters. So uh, when we get there, we'll get there. Um, I fucking I love this book. It's great. <laughs> I think yeah, everyone, read this book in your free time. Check it out or read it along with us. Maybe you don't have a, a bunch of free time, so that's why you're here watching us read it. Um, yep. It's a good fucking book. I think it's it's better than a lot of other books. Yeah, and the reason I wanted to do this after uh, that last episode was specifically because it is not necessary that bringing the exchange relation back to the forefront necessarily renders uh, impossible social change. It's not, it's not true that uh, a focus on the exchange relation um, undermines um, a focus on the mode of production. Um, it's not necessary that it covers over the, the fact that things can still be useful to us or that we actually put labor into things. Um, so I wanted to really show this in play. Um, of course, there's a lot of stuff I didn't remember here that was really cool to go over. There's like exciting. Um, and that's the stuff that's, it's kind of like this bigger perspective and like a, a, the stage theory thing being fleshed out. It's awesome. But I think the thing that sticks with me the most from this is just that yeah, I already had gift exchange in my mind. I already had gift, counter gift. That was already there. I did not really think about the state in its emergence as an exchange relation that founds a mode of production. I, I, that's I think I think maybe maybe you weren't explicitly aware, but I do think that was I do think that was um a thought in your mind. And that actually takes me back to the conversations we were having in Seattle. Um, when we were talking about, um, the state and, and kind of the progression of a state and what is a state and pseudo state and all this, we were engaged with, um, someone who very clearly has read a lot and spent a lot of time thinking about it, but we had some disagreements with his, his, uh, articulation of what a state is. And I and I think it was founded in the fact that that state is a framework for exchange that kind of does present a unique uh, type of production. So I think um, I think you were already thinking along these lines. Maybe it wasn't explicit. Maybe it wasn't a fully formed thought. But I do think um, I think we were both kind of going down that path because. I mean, that's that's what I think we were getting at when we were having that conversation in Seattle. I think we've gotten at it a few ways. And that's yeah, yeah, that, that that's one way. Another, 
But, you know, there, there's having a glimmer of something and then there's someone laying it out all crystal clear. Right. Um, but no, we also talked about how the mode of production in its division of labor is already a form of exchange. Um, it's a it's the mirror of the exchange, but it's not just like, oh, it developed in its material uh, form in the factory and then came this mode of exchange. No, this mode of exchange was in all previous societies and uh, it just wasn't universalized. And um, the the political base state and political base yeah. in in the actual base, not the superstructure like that had a big role to play. And of course, he gets into why here, which was the monarchy working with the bourgeoisie as opposed to the feudal lords warring with the Pope. There was this these religious wars that created the conditions for these cities to go, hey, you know, this thing we're doing, let's do it better. Let's do it more. And of course, this was the same time that science was kind of coming into full bloom because of the, you know, these not just these religious wars, but also guys like Descartes using rhetoric and reason to try to be like, you know, guys, hey, it's all great. We'll be able to have a world of devices and free up our time. And also our workers will be good little workers still. Um, this is all happening at that same time. And so it's really interesting. Um, thank you. Kojin Karatani, I hope that if you see this, you're not upset that we're reading your book um, onto the internet. I hope that you know that this will make more people want to read it, hopefully. Um, I hope that this will, I mean, audit, I ordered a copy. Uh, I want to be able to hold it in my hands because I, it's obvious that you've put a lifetime of study into this. You're bringing in Polanyi, you're bringing in Weber, you're bringing in Kant and Hegel. We're going to Nietzsche and Schmidt. Like there are so many areas that most theory people just stay in one little corner of for their whole lives. And you go so far beyond and someone like Byung-Chul Han gets all the limelight today, but you're out here doing the work while he's out there kind of like restating what other people have said in slightly different ways, making a little bit more popular, sexy, approachable for artists. But he's not like, setting up the framework for something new. Um, at least maybe he is, maybe I'm not being fair, but, um, this, this is great. I think this is a real contribution. Yeah. It's exciting. This, this book is very fucking exciting. And with that, we're out guys. Oh, no, we're not quick little PSA before the PSA. There's two, we got so many PSAs here. But no, this is important. This really <laughs> matters. Um, if you've been here for all of the Capital Monday so far, you're part of a little gang gang. Uh, there's probably like, I don't know, 10 people like you in the world. And uh, you are people like Sahil in the sense that you are reading into this stuff. You've been reading into this stuff or you've been meaning to be reading into this stuff. Like this is not something that you randomly said, oh, yeah, I'm going to go the distance with you guys. No. You were already wanting to do it and you understood, like Sahil said, it's not easy uh, trying to organize stuff like this. It's, it's, it, it's a whole other wheelhouse. Um, and so what I want to encourage everybody to do is to get involved. I'm going to make it so that you can sign up for six months of the Capital Mondays and Capital Seminar. So the Capital Seminar is related to Capital Mondays. But if you're signed up, you get access to the actual live Zoom call. We can be in the chat and you can be on the Google Doc and we'll email you ahead of time so you always know when it's going to happen because secret, most of these don't happen on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it's at, yeah. it's, a, it's at least 50-50 at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny, but yeah. No, it doesn't always happen on Monday. It was actually pure chance that Sahil caught us on a Monday. Um, we do it on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays based on like what works for us. But if somebody is in this seminar, uh, we'll try to accommodate to your schedule um, and we'll always give you a heads up of when shit's going to go down. Uh, we'll always uh, blah, 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 blah. So 
if you want to, if you want to like be in it with us, then that's the first thing that you'd be able to do. The second thing is that we'll actually have a call in. We'll actually have a round table. We'll actually have a sort of seminar component. We'll actually bring our notes to the table. And then you all get to go over the notes and talk about them yourselves. You get to you know, talk about your recommended suggestions for the different uh, additions to the notes. You get to uh, sometimes after the first few months uh, get to the point where you're doing presentations if you want. Um, and that means that those presentations could ultimately go towards papers that are going to end up in the anthologies that are ultimately going to come out of this kind of research. And so, um, you know, what's that worth? Uh, well, uh, I'd I wish I lived in a, in a society where we're just, it's gift exchange and we didn't have to put numbers on things. Um, but because I am tired and my wife is tired and our house is needing to get cleaned and we don't want to have to pay a maid and we'd just like to be able to kind of be here a little bit more often and full-time theory underground and have a life outside of that. Uh, we actually have to put prices on things for now. Um, so how much is it worth? Well, how much would a college, uh, charge you while well, the university would charge you uh for a single class uh at least fifteen hundred dollars but that could also be fifteen hundred per credit hour now of course if you're from europe or if you're from some other enlightened uh place then chances are it's like 20 bucks or whatever but we live in the united states we are getting uh we're not getting it good over here all right this this, this education system is insane but that's true. People do spend that kind of money on classes. And when I actually have to think about, okay, well, I'm probably only going to get a few students, even if that's the thing is if it's, you know, if I, if I were to sell it for 50 bucks, I still would only get a few people anyway. But when it actually has the, the number on it that somewhat resembles the kind of uh, value of my labor power, like there's some kind of a semblance there. And like, there's, we're trying to approximate that idea of like, well, I actually have socially necessary um, costs and therefore I have to give a certain amount of my labor power to this society. Uh, oh, well, if we could do it this way, that would be better. So you give me 1500 bucks, you get a whole six months of this where you get the monthly meetings, uh, you get to do presentations, we read your shit, we critique it or give you good feedback potentially to get published, like all of this stuff. It goes above and beyond anything that you're going to get at the university. And uh, we already know that you're in it for the right reasons because you're not going to get credit from it. So, uh, but that, that's 1500 For basically half that price, you can be a tier three subscriber. Tier four subscriber gets the same thing, but a tier three subscriber, 150 bucks a month. Uh, you'll get access to all that, plus all the past courses at Theory Underground plus the two seminars that happen on the second Sunday and fourth Sunday of every month. That's critical media theory and critical doxology and time energy seminars. Those are the highlights of my month. Every time they happen, every time they happen, I forget that there is anything outside of those. And I just think that's the best thing. And uh, it's because it's kind of where all of the stuff that we do in these deeper dives into courses, whether they're short courses or long courses, all culminates back in critical theory, critical media theory and uh, critical doxology and time energy. So that's CMT and CDT. You get access to CMT and CDT uh, through these tiers, through these subscription tiers. So get on it. Get involved. This is the time. We're out here banging the pots and pans. Come on, everybody. It's dinner time. Let's bring it in. We're, we're expanding the, 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 the circle a little bit. We're making it so you can sit at the table. Um, if you're, uh, sitting in a hospital and you don't have arms or legs, uh, but you've been following along with all of this and you're just super bummed out because you can't work a job and your mom won't give you some extra money and you don't get disability yet and you're completely fucked. We do have a scholarship. Um, <laughs> if you are, uh, I mean, seriously, if you are in a shitty situation, no matter what your shitty situation is, we're here for you. We've got a scholarship for you. Don't worry about it. But you kind of have to actually tell us about your situation just a little bit so we kind of know where you're coming from, you know? Anything you want to add to that, Nance? Um, yeah, I, I, I am looking forward to kind of having our, our roundup sessions with all the other people that have been following along who are willing to be engaged. 
Um, because again, you know, like I said earlier, we are we are kind of all engaged in in this struggle together. Um, so do you know? Do what you can do. Make it happen. And much love. Yeah, make it happen. And and we'll be back next Monday or actually next Sunday when this goes live and we'll be hardcore dancing for the revolution and it'll be really cool. I'm looking forward to listening to this while I'm at work. I'll be in the premiere saying hello. All right. And also I hope that more people should start coming for the premieres. Um, now that I work later in the day, I think it's harder for people in Europe. Uh, where are my Americans at? What the hell? All right, peace. Oh, Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about, is just like seeing what's in the mainstream, being like it ain't there, and kind of like cobbling something together, you know? And, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist. He's like, hey, someone says a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've right, thought right, about, that right. you think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive, so excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, 
I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living. And then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of The Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. For your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you too.